And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother, the bane of my existence, the man of a thousand runes, and the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, bringing you, bringing you up to 10,000%. And it's more appropriate to bring that up, give, given what was recently announced for the 50th anniversary of Common Rider. Indeed. Because we are inevitably going to have a situation where Guy and <laughs> our and our Lord and our Lord and Savior Dan Kuroda are in the same room. <laughs> and I stand above both of those weak bitches. <laughs> but you know. As much as I'm the bane of your existence, at least I have standards. I'm not OBS. <laughs> yes, OBS has continued to fuck with me, which is why this particular episode is being pre-recorded, and future episodes of Gazette and Geek Watch will be pre-recorded until I figure out a way out of this bullshit. I've done this before. I'm going to be doing it again. So... As you can see, the this particular episode is Class Warfare, Monster Hunter Weapons as Classes, because, well, Monster Hunter Rise just came out, so why not strike while the iron is hot? It's going to be a while before I get it, because I'm waiting on the PC version, because I plan on modding this, because I plan on modding the shit out of it and watching other people's mods much in the same way I did with World, because... You know how you know how people got really butt mad about about mo about modding not modding but um including um everyone's fa everyone's favorite blade waifus from Xenoblade Chronicles. <laughs> well, so oh, so butt mad they made jiggle physics mods for it. I I had said, "Hey, it's called the Gynax bounce. Have some culture." Uh, uh the Gynax bounce. Mm -hmm. But I had I had always been I had I had always been un been under the been under the approach that the mod the modding scene at art ha is gonna beat is gonna beat you to the punch on that because just a few years before this went down they had modded both they had modded both of them into <laughs> a as a as hunters for Monster Hunter World. Inclu including giving, and of course, Pira's um, setup was, for all, in, in fact, both of them, their setup was, for all intents and purposes, a charge blade. Although there is some, there is something absolutely hilarious about see, about seeing both of them eat at the um, Palico dinner table. <laughs> you know, ha having th having them eat eat with the us sized meal. <laughs> Yep, yep. And it and neither of them strike me as the type to eat with that much gusto. No, does make does me. Then again, there was that one. I do remember one of the characters in Sukihime, who is who is notorious for being the champion beef eater. <laughs> uh. And this, despite looking absolutely nothing like. Nothing like it, except for being a tall woman with red hair. Yeah. Well, tall by Japanese standards, I should say. Hey, and if it and if somebody's gonna cry cry, cry racism over over me making a sh or me making a short Asian joke, every a every Asian person I know makes a short joke. <laughs> Not only that, considering our heights, everybody is fucking short. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if, if if you think this is a stereotype or not. It's not a stereotype. You're all just fucking short. Much like much like me making fun of Picard surrendering, it's not a stereotype if it if it ends up being true. Is <laughs> there? During those during those early seasons of TNG, I kept making jokes about about Picard surrendering so often, and I said. Well, you, well, he is French, so Nick, so it's certainly fitting. Uh, you know, I I do have to, I do have to stick up for the French here, even even against my better judgment. Um, please remember Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh, I remember. 
but I all but I'm also well I'm also well aware that the that the that the winningest the winningest battle that the French have been in was the French Revolution because the opponent was also French. <laughs> uh. See, most people try most people try and try and make it, make it clear that their show that their show is a safe space for 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 people of all races, ethnicities, and the like. We are not a safe space for anybody. We are not up our our stuff is NSF NSFL, not safe for life. But getting back on the rails. So when Rise had when Rise had come out, and I started watching a lot of the a lot of the weapon showcases and get and giving my giving my usual prep, to which I have to give my eternal gratitude once again to Gaijin Hunter, who has been, whose work is instrumental in help in helping me with my research. Again, and not only is it instrumental, he's a uh, he's the er prototype for other YouTubers such as uh, Arix and Rage Gaming, who also do a lot of showcases and um, informative work with Monster Hunter. Mm -hmm. And the informative style videos are the ones that I'm always going to lean towards because I can deal I can deal with people I can deal with people's bad jokes, but I want to at least get something out of it. Yeah, and uh, and trust me, I uh, I follow all three of them. Um, always, their their videos are always informative in some fashion. Rage Gaming tries to make it as entertaining as possible, and they they're usually pretty good. At it. <laughs> but that that ended up getting me thinking about adapting the adapting Monster Hunter to tabletop gaming. Now. I do want to make a couple. I do want to make a couple caveats because there's a lot of ways that this could be taken, and I decided to go with a class system for for one major reason. For all intents and purposes, each of the weapons is their own fighting style and thus their own playstyle, i.e., their own class. And two, I felt this would be a good way to a good way to showcase that you can have an, you can have an interesting set of dynamics without having to rely on fucking casters. Which Very is much also, so. I do remember seeing one article, and hey, hey there, Doku. Hey, what's up, guys? You, I would say that you are late and gay, but one, we already did that joke, and two, um, you man, you managed to miss me complete in complete rage and drinking mode over OBS's bullshit. Oh, he, let me let, let me guess. OBS decided to uh, take a crap on you. Yes. Yep, that's OBS for you. We're all uh, we're all drinking uh, our liquor of choice right now. Well, I just got back from my uncle's house, so I don't have any whiskey, but I do at least have some beer. So I'll go ahead and crack one and join you guys. I'm having vodka. <laughs> I'm having vodka and pure cranberry. And mm. I'm having Tennessee honey. Uh, well, fortunately, I at least did have some whiskey while I was at my uncle's house, so I'm not too far behind. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good stuff. I love Tennessee honey. Tennessee honey is good stuff. But <clears throat> the thing, the but when it com when it comes to this when it comes to this approach, um, I do remember seeing an article on it was either Bell of Lost Souls or somebody else, probably Bell of Lost Souls because that's all they fucking do these days. <laughs> um, of adapting Monster Hunter to. D and D five E, and I decided I am not going to go down that route, for several reasons. One, the big damn elephant in the room that's decided to break into my house and take it and take a crash in front of the TV. That is, with a fantasy setting, even one that wants to claim, oh, you can do all kinds of fantasy with D and D. No, that's bullshit. You know it. Don't. You can lie to yourselves, but don't lie to me. Is the fact that D the fact that a lot of fantasy games, D and D especially, is still reliant on needing magic systems to make things interesting. Monster Hunter may be a fantastical setting, but when the fuck did you see anybody doing spell casting? The closest magical things in Monster Hunter are not the hunters. It's the Elder Dragons. Remember, people, in Monster Hunter, all the monsters are considered just megafauna. They're giant animals, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. 
yes, they can cause devastation. It's never intentional. <clears throat> and it's usually just something about them encroaching on the territory of the people around them. Uh, most of the time, monster hunters try to get, according to lore, get monsters away from habitation without ever needing to harm them. Luring them away, uh, scaring them away, even even going so far as fighting and capturing them and then relocating them, much like a, an animal control unit. Um, mm -hmm. But the Elder Dragons... Uh, in some cases, the Elder Dragons remind people of dragons. Just look at Kishala Daora. It's a giant steel dragon that controls wind. But... On the other end of things, there are things called Elder Dragons that don't look like dragons at all. I am looking at you, Kieran. <sighs> now, I, I could go into this. I could be pedantic and talk and talk about how closely related to dragons Kieran's are in mythology, but that's that's, that's pedantic, <laughs> like you said. <laughs> mm -hmm. The reason that the Monster Hunter Society uses the term Elder Dragon for these types of creatures is because they're no longer a part of ecology. They define ecology. They control ecology. Uh, as I said, Kishaladora, steel dragon that literally controls the wind, makes tempests wherever it goes. You've got Teostra, lives in a volcano, causes giant explosions. You, uh, looking at very recent entries, such as Monster Hunter World, you've got Nergigante, who is this giant endlessly regenerating motherfucker that eats other elder dragons for fun and profit. <clears throat> These things are beyond understanding in certain aspects. They're the magical piece of the Monster Hunter world. This is going to be fun for me because I might be the only nerd on the planet that never actually got into Monster Hunter. Oh, trust me, Doku. Uh, until Monster Hunter World, we were a niche within a niche. I've been told multiple times, no, you should check it out. And I just haven't. It's been on my list for quite some time. Just have gotten around to it. I'm um, not surprised you, by that in the least. I would well, suggest with the newest entry, actually, to move to move into our point. Monster Hunter Rise, it did just come out. Uh, fantastic game. It's coming out on PC next year, which is what Monk is waiting for. If you have a Nintendo Switch, you can get it now. If you want to wait for PC, wait for PC, but this would be the perfect time to come into the series. Well, I guess I'll be waiting a year, because as Mildred knows, my list is long, but that at least gives me some time to catch up on some stuff, so I won't be too, uh, too swamped. So I'll actually go ahead and put it on my list. Uh, right. Just to touch on the point you were talking about, so it sounds like the... Uh, the Elder Dragons or the magical element of this universe is kind of more like sentient natural disasters or calamities. It's they're quite literally a force of nature, not just in the sense of, oh, hey, look, it's an overgrown tiger. It's like, no, this is literally the element of wind being wielded by something that you shouldn't piss off. Yes, quite literally a force of nature. That is the perfect way to describe it. That's, in fact, how in lore, in many of the, the uh, games, they say, these things are a force of nature. Full stop. Oh, wow. Um, so that was a bit more on the head than I expected it to be. Good to know. <laughs> for, for example, there have been numerous Monster Hunter games. And uh, I'm sorry for stealing the thunder here, uh, Mildred, but this is kind of my... I was counting on it. My, my, my time to shine. Um, <laughs> the... Monster Hunter games have always innovated with each game in the series. They've always introduced new monsters, new mechanics, and new what some would call gimmicks. Um, <clears throat> and as such, you get an escalating level of power, but the power of scaling never feels like a shonen battle anime, so you're good. Okay, so but, it's not DBZ. Gotcha. But just to give you some uh, some information in monster hunter for you there was a, an elder dragon 440 meters long called dalamater a giant snake that crushes the tips of mountains no i say snake but it does have arms and legs um <clears throat> you made explosive weaponry and out of its out of its bits <laughs> 
But with the in introduction of Monster Hunter World in the Rotten Vale, much of the Rotten Vale, if you look up and take a closer look, is a giant skull and long line of vertebrae and ribs. And the skull is very reminiscent of Dalamater, which led many of us to believe, and Capcom to never ever reveal, that maybe the Dalamater you fight in For You is an infant. Oh, and Shaw Dalamater grows to the size of mountain ranges. That's that would be terrifying. And also, I I love it. Just as a side note, I love it when games actually do things like that, but actually have the foresight to not answer it and just leave it up to fan speculation. Because we love we love Easter eggs like that. That's the whole. There, there's entire segments of the community that are dedicated to nothing but Easter eggs. Like okay, so. Uh, let me tell you something. I have a friend that I actually play Monster Hunter Rise with very frequently. He streams it. Um, my buddy and I have had a saying about Monster Hunter for a long time. Monster Hunter is the underrated king of, of minute details. Small things you can find everywhere in every game that, unless you looked closely... It's a blink and you miss moment, or it's a huh moment, and you don't really think about it unless you take the time. Um, one of the most recent ones, and this is a small thing, um, in Rise, your farming system, in order to farm certain materials without having to go out and pick them up off of maps all the time, uh, sends your little hunting buddies called Palicos out in submarines to go collect, collect these uh, items. And if you send them out and immediately go to the gathering hub and out onto the deck of the gathering hub to look at the river, you can actually see them floating down from where you sent them through the river, bumping into each other and having fun. It's a tiny detail. It's something you may never encounter if you don't go to the gathering hub immediately after you send off your, your farm. But if you do, you'll see it. And That's it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, and it's not, it's not something that... It's something like 95% of people are never going to run into. And this is the same for weapons and armor and lore. And so this is, this is the draw of Monster Hunter. And so this is why we wanted to take the time to focus on the weapons and how you might be able to take those weapons into a tabletop. Now... There are 14 weapons mm -hmm. for the base games, not counting the, the online game Frontier or some of the other games. <laughs> they, they have three extra weapons that we are not discussing today. Because the one, the, um, the Frontier games are, are online only in Japan, and even, the, even, if I were, even if I were sufficiently fluent in the language... Um, I'm not doing that kind of finagling to get on a Japanese server again. I did that kind of thing a long time ago with a different game, and I'm not doing. I'm not doing it. Did it for Fantasy Star Online too. And when it and when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the third and when it comes to the third one that we're not touching, that's on a, that's on a mobile game, and that means my policy has to come into effect. No mobile games. Mobile games, no thank you. Now, the 14 weapons are an evolution over time. These It didn't used to be 14 weapons. It used to be much smaller back in Monster Hunter 1. Mm -hmm. But we have Great Sword, Long Sword, Sword and Shield, Dual Blades, Hammer, Hunting Horn, Lance, Gun Lance, Switch Axe, also known as Slash Axe in Japan. Charge Blade, also known as Charge Axe in Japan. Insect Glaive, Light Bow Gun, Heavy Bow Gun, and Bow. Now, none of these weapons are magical in nature. Uh, they can sometimes apply statuses or elemental damage depending on the bits of monsters you've used to make them. But... Inherently, these are big old pieces of metal and bone and, and monster scales all melded into a giant flashy weapon that does 
amazing things. They're also all inherently fucking gigantic. Even sword and shield is pretty big. Um, the shields are big and chunky, even though they're only the size of a forearm, maybe, in most cases. And the swords are about as long as the leg of the hunter. But they're the, I would say that dual blades and sword and shield are the smallest weapons in the game. Mm-hmm. Even the bow is larger. <laughs> and it's, un- it's understandable that they're this big because, well, the, even, the, even the beginner tier of monsters that you'll be hunting aren't, exa- aren't exactly small boys. Yeah, the, the, the Great Jaggy, one of the most iconic beginner monsters in the series, is like, the si- is like triple the size of a Utah Raptor. This thing is big enough to be, I would say, 14 meters long from nose to tail. It's a big boy. It's, mm-hmm. it's still a small boy compared to things like the Wyvern Raffalos or... Again, Shah Dalamater, 440 meters long and crushes mountains. Mm-hmm. But these weapons need to be big. Because you're fighting megafauna. Yeah. And well, they definitely took the uh, monster aspect and ran with it. <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> there is a reason Monster Hunter has a dedicated following in, in both Japan and, and the US. Now, as, as much as these weapons are an evolution... They've also been affected by whatever the specific... I don't want to call it a gimmick, because gimmick is has negative connotations. The specific special feature of whatever Monster Hunter game they're in happens to be. Mm-hmm. Because every Monster Hunter game, people are like, oh, Monster Hunter just is the same thing over and over again. And these are people who have never played the games, clearly. Because every Monster Hunter game introduces some new mechanic. And... In some cases, that mechanic becomes a core, such as uh, the particular uh, mounting system was a core for a while, and Mm -hmm. it's still around, it's just been changed and modified. Um, In some cases, it's only around for one game. For example, uh, certain statuses that were found in Monster Hunter 4U called Frenzy never made it into further games. Just hearing that, I'm getting some strong Magic the Gathering vibes. Um, I don't know I, if it's accurate or not, but that's just how it sounds to me. I, I would not say that that's accurate, but that's only because I'm slightly biased against MTG these days. Uh, I don't blame you. <laughs> the, the mechanics that are specific to Rise are called the Wire Bug and the Iron Silk mechanics. And so when discussing these weapons today... We will not be considering these types of mechanics. Not the Clutch Claw from World, not the Iron Silk and Wire Bugs from Rise, uh, not even mounting. Mounting is a mechanic that's technically outside of the weapon itself and a part of just the general fighting of the monster. We are considering the weapons themselves. As such, I am going to use the newest incarnations of the weapons from Rise for my, for my uh, starting point. Uh, but again, things like switch skills, which are also involved in the wire bugs uh, system, are not considered. This is going to be their base uh, weapon loadout and what they can do. All right. Additionally, oh, sorry. Um, additionally, there's a set of talents that uh, we're going to be looking at that are universal to how hunters fight. And so I, I almost think of these as a monster hunter as the class and the weapons as a loadout within that class. Given now, give, given that, given that I do, I do before you end up getting into the talents thing, um, there's a, there's some there's something that, there's a few things that I think we need to bring up to set the stage. One is the is the fact that I don't think it would be off base of me to say that Monster Hunter leans far in far more in the direction of um so, of sort of sword and sorcery or low fantasy than it does the high fantasy that a lot of people see things as. Yeah, it's it's very very 
uh, low fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, se- secondly, we need to we need if I already mentioned that um, that we're not using D and D, we're not you we're cer- we're certainly not and we're certainly not using um, Pathfinder. We are using Thirteenth Age as the basis for this. And I chose this for this. This was my call, and I chose this for several reasons. The first is the idea of doing twenty levels worth of entry for all for each type of weapon seemed overkill. And I know somebody might say, "Well, just just use just do the whole subclass thing." That's a that's Wizard's way of thinking. That's not how I work. I'm not the I'm not the kind of person who just says, "Oh, just force it into a subclass of one of our already established classes." No. No, 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 wrong. Second, secondly, there, there, like I said before, there's the magical elephant in the room, so I wanted to use something that could have um, an, an, an interesting amount of dynamic without falling back on magic. And, no, and thir- third, I am, I am not going to do the whole do the whole oh, oh just have just have it as G, just have it as GM fiat attitude that so that so many grognards have because because that because that doesn't work either they'd probably just have it as they'd probably just have every different type as a variant of fighter and i have no desire to go through that bullshit now what because of because of that when i lined everything up 13th Age was the one that was most fitting. Now, I have reviewed 13th Age on two videos in the past. One when I was comparing it to Unity, who I would love to I would love to get in contact with the developers of Unity, but they've but they just disappeared a while back. And two the the uh, the review of it of its major class expansion, 13 True Ways. Thirteenth Age does have a ten-level setup for its classes, using the three-tier setup that you saw in D and D four E. But there is there are no static levels. Every le- every singular level is going to get you something, and it's going to be something that you're gonna want to have. Yeah. And it's for it's for that reason that I cho- that I chose Thirteenth Age as the basis for this. Initially, we were going to go with the idea that each um, weapon would be its own class, but as time went as time went on, that became a little bit trickier to do. So we improvised because, as the saying goes, no plan survives the first encounter. Now, when you were developing this, I had all I had asked I had asked you to, ha- to handle that short list. Now. I do before we get into that I do need to explain talents. Talents are a kind of class feature that every that every class has that they can elect into. They are the optional form of class features. I would compare them to perks in Call of Duty in the sense that your choice of talents and you're going to have two or three of them at the start is going to be a det- is going to determine your leanings as far as how you express what that particular class can do. There are some classes that have talents that are specifically designed to dip into abilities of other talents of or of other uh, classes. And there are some ge- there are some generic ends of t- of talents. But for for example, I will use I will use a few examples from the f- from the um barbarian um ta- um, talents, and I should note that each each one of the talents is um, is is self-contained. Some of the some of them are tiered off, like the one like the ones for the barbarian. But for for example, let's for example, let's look at Slayer. You know, during your turn when you attack a staggered enemy you are not engaged with, at the start of your turn, deal plus one d six damage per level to the to that creature, and that's the other thing. Even your basic attack isn't going to suck because damage is not set. Yeah. It's a per level thing, so ev- so everything gradually is going to be getting better. Um 
the just the just from first to to second level for barbarian, you'd get an additional modifier when it comes to your hit points. Um, you'd get it. You'd get an additional, and you would get a additional feat. Mm. In addition to the per level modifiers that uh, that occupy so much of of the system, because it's take it's taking the half level bonus that was in fourth edition and structuring and just slimming it down, because you're dealing with you're dealing with ten levels instead of thirty. And the and that is the reason why we ch why we went with this one. I had thought about doing fantasy craft since it is theoretically flexible enough to handle. The kind of equipment that's seen in Monster Hunter. The only reason I didn't is because somebody else already beat me to it a long time ago. And I can see that. And um, basically made a set of feats for for different we for different weapons. Now some of some of the weapons in Monster Hunter didn't need any new feats because they were already um, there. There was already a, a good amount of them already. The uh, sword type, the sword type ones especially. They did. They didn't need a whole. They didn't need a whole lot. There's already a set of feats for great swords, um, and some and some of those could just as well apply with long swords. Um, sword and shield. There's already plenty for that. Um, dual blades. There's already plenty for that. And dual wielding doesn't suck because this isn't third edition. Um, and somebody had already had already statted out how to do some of the more complex things like gun lances and switch axes. The insect glaive wasn't around yet, so that so that wasn't put in. But it wouldn't be too hard to do. Um. So that and for that for all of those reasons, everything everything fell to you to using um thirteenth age as our approach. Plus, I find thirteenth age to be a very underrated entry. Now, as we said earlier, there are three weapons we're not touching. Simply because we don't have reliable access to it. Those being the Tonfa, which some could argue anything that the Tonfa does is already being handled by the Insect Glaive. The Magnet Spike, which, look, which even which from what I've seen of it looks ridiculous even by Monster Hunter standards. Oh, it definitely is. <laughs> it, it looks like a bat. It looks like a batlith on drugs. And well, remember, there's that magnet part mm -hmm. in there. Um, and the Excel axe, which just look, which just looks like it, which is all, well, it's an axe with rockets on it. Because there's nothing that says acceleration like rockets. And Ooh, or I have to ask, rockets? Uh, I'm intrigued. It, as intriguing as it is, um, the Excel X was in the mobile game, so can't do it. Oh, oh damn, that's a shame. Oh well. Um, although when you listed off the weapons, I noticed that you did that. You didn't put in the um, the medium bow gun, and I'm guessing that's because that only showed up once. Yes, because it only showed up once, and it isn't in the current incarnation of weapons. Oh. And to be honest, I, pr I probably would have taken the same approach myself simply because I could easily see somebody taking taking the medium to be a to be the jack of all trades and I'm I'm of the opinion that when you choose one of these you should be taking strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. And it's for it's for the same reason that I um I've never I even when I play F even when I play shooters, I've never been fond of the idea of a ja of a jack of all trades weapon. Well, in the long run, it makes you less effective. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's the reason why I understand why um, Team Fortress Two got got rid of the got rid of the standard assault rifle as a weapon. Yep. Oh, granted, I think it I think it was a bit too liberal in giving some wep some characters a shotgun like. Why the fuck would that? Why the fuck should a heavy have a shotgun? Yeah, heavy sh heavy weapons guys should continue to have, you know, guns that shoot lots of bullets. Yeah. Um. If anything, 
if I was designing the thing, I'd probably I'd probably just have that his secondary is the riot gun from Shadow Warrior, which is just a revolving shotgun. Well, heavy weapons guy's secondary weapon has always been his fists. Or the sandwich. Yes, I know. <laughs> but we will st we will start at we will start at the t before we get to them. I do want to. Um, I do want to delve a bit into the into into one other thing that we decided we would not do, and that <laughs> that is the whole blade master and gu and gunner armor mot motif that w that's it that's been in past games. I am actually glad that that was ta that that's been taken out. And so are a lot of other people. It's only the grognards who are like, you should still have to choose the difference between the two because because. Gunners are supposed to be a distance, and they're supposed to take more damage if they get too close. Because grognards are gonna grog. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, my, now, when it com when it comes to the idea of when it comes to the idea of cl of class based armor, I'd be okay. I'd be okay with that if this was a game that what that was built around that kind of thing, and it's not. It's largely built around, built around largely being freeform. So the idea, though, the idea of classed armor doesn't really make sense. Yeah, the the limitations imposed upon you by Monster Hunter are not by the armor you wear, but by the weapon you choose. Each weapon has its very own unique playstyle. Each weapon has its own unique strengths. Each weapon has its own unique weaknesses. Mm hmm. That is why everybody has preferred sets of weapons. Yep. <laughs> and and to be and to be honest, um, this is not re this is not really a game that's going to that's going to be rewarding for people trying to play things on the defensive. Mm-hmm. But what's but before we get into the individual weapons, let's talk a bit about the talents that you had as that little um, short list. Ah, uh, yes, the universal talents. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from Paladin, the talent Fearless. Now I know that this is more for fluff reasons than for mechanical reasons, but uh, in Monster Hunter, specifically, hunters are the bravest of the brave. They are bad. They don't stop fighting and run away. They fight because if they don't fight, everyone else is going to die. That's, gener that's generally what it means when a hunter actually has, when a team of hunters has to actually go out and do a, a, a slay quest. That there's a, an inherent threat coming to wherever they're going, and they need to repel it now. No. And so, uh, with fearless, you know, you're immune to fear. Mm-hmm. And any non-damage effects and attacks named or described as fear attacks. Um, in addition, you gain a plus one melee attack bonus against enemies that are not engaged by any of your allies. That's um, that that particular bonus right there is not as important as the first part, being immune to fear. Mm -hmm. Now, there are going to be some people who have played Monster Hunter that argue, well, what about when a monster roars? Watch the animation, assholes. You're not cowering in fear. You're covering your ears. There's the reason that the skill that stops monster roars from stunning you is called ear plugs. So that, that's the... F and of course, of course, the... Um the associated feats also would also apply when it comes to f now something that I something that I do want do want to ask when it comes to the universal when, when it comes to the universal talents are yes. you putting those in as to as ta as um talents that ev that that any monster hunter has or are these ones that they ha that would take up their talent slots when building a character so when it comes to the universal talents um this this is this is where things got a little iffy for me because as the talents are described they are things that as a monster hunter in the games you have at base they're there you are basic 
thing you can already do. It's not you could create a character and you learn them. They're there. Um, and this is this is where I hesitated to say that whether this t this takes a talent slot or is something that you would have to spend a talent slot on. I believe that in this case, the 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 f five of these talents that I have on the list are going to be talents that they, they, they it's just it's just a part of who they are that's that's going to be something that they get automatically as part of the class this is monster hunters are not an adventurer at the start of their of their career essentially monster hunters are people who have already gone through the training are already licensed by the hunting guild and as such, they've already had their skills assessed and already show they have these qualities. I should I should note that something I was considering instead of using instead of listing off the le the levels and tiers, but actually have actually having it that you can only instead of doing some experience thing, which I never really bother with experience points anyways. Mm -hmm. Instead, have it be your tier of um, license. Low rank, high rank, and and G rank or master rank with newer games. Yeah, which like still there's the th still, still there's adventure the... champion and epic. Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as, as far as doing the retitling, that that's I can do I can do that in a heartbeat in 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 any in, in any um word editor that I have. Yeah. Um. Ultimately, the last two. That I'm willing to say you would, you might need to spend a, sl uh, a slot on, are more associated with the fact that these are optional items you don't necessarily have to bring with you on every hunt, or optional means. So, um, with that, I, I'll I'll move on to to one of those. The first talent that I think you might need to spend a talent slot on is Ranger's Animal Companion. Um. All monster hunters, since at the very least the third game, have had the option to bring along at least one helper companion in solo hunts. Um, in three, these were a race of tribal beings known as shakalakas. Uh, and since four and beyond, uh, we've had palicos, which are cat people that stand upright and are adorable as hell. Um, and then finally with Rise, they also introduced another companion known as the Palamute, which is a, a dog that is the size of a pony that you can literally ride and um, is your best friend and I am never go not going without a dog and people can fuck you, fight me. But it's not a requirement. You don't have to have them with you to go on hunts. Um, in fact, you can unassign them from you at any point and leave them. So that's one that I think might be one you'd choose to spend a talent into because of the fact that it is an optional uh, aspect of being a hunter. So if I were writing this, I'm, gu I'm guessing for universal talents, you'd probably have fearless and optional animal companion. Yes, I had. Th I I was about to ask whether or not whether or not you whether or not you'd consider putting in Ranger's pet instead, but then I realized Ranger's pets would be too small because they're basically, um, the size of crows or ravens mm -hmm. or maybe even the size of a badger. Yeah, we'll get to Ranger's pet when we get to another weapon. <laughs> um, it's funny that you bring that up because it's perfect for a specific weapon, and I'll get into that when we get to that weapon. Yeah. Now, it could be argued that we're that this is that we're going to have balancing problems since normally, animal companion takes two talent slots. Mm -hmm. I would argue that that's not going to be the case here, sim simply because of the fact that you, when when somebody is picking animal companion, they are making a conscious choice to make to make their set make their setup more complex. Mm -hmm. Um now the next 
universal talent that is, again, part of being a monster hunter and thus non-optional is, again, in Ranger, it's Tracker. All monster hunters can track the monsters. They know how to find spore and footprints and other things to track a monster. Additionally, the terrain stunt po portion of the Tracker talent uh, covers improvisational uh, traps that you can find in the environment in the games. Things like a set of fireflies that if you disturb them create a bright flashbang and you've now given the monster a, a flashbang and made it confused. Or knocking down some vines, getting a monster to knock down a huge tree to knock down some vines on top of it and act as an impromptu net trap. That, that's, that's perfect for a terrain stunt. That's yeah. absolutely within the realm of terrain stunt and all hunters can do it. Yeah, and I'm put. I, I should note that I'm right. That I'm that I'm writing what we've got. What we've got on a um, on a on a document. Um, yeah. And I'm pr I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure most of now when it comes. So it's so fearless and tracker. You're thinking are going to be universal. I.e., even at even at the start, you're going to have these. And animal companion mm -hmm. is a optional one. Yep. Uh, the uh, and and like I said, out of the the list of seven of these universal feats, most of them are things that are inherent as part of being a hunter. Mm -hmm. oh. And that's that's why I'm I I was hesitant to create a universal list in the first place, but realized that there was no other choice. Yeah. Um, what would be what af after um, tracker? What would come? What would come next? In the rogue tree is going to be the next optional trap sense. Now, I know trap sense is, is mostly involving finding traps and making sure that you don't get hurt from traps. But monster monster hunters also use traps potentially to uh to capture a monster and take it elsewhere. Now, I I couldn't find a talent that covered that specifically. And I, I figure that's more an equipment-based thing. Um, if that's the case, I'm more than happy to say the trap sense just goes out the window and doesn't matter. But uh, th that's the reason that I had trap sense as an, as an optional universal, was it conforms most to the trapping part of hunting. And is not something that you have to have with you. you I've, I haven't trapped a single monster in Monster Hunter Rise yet because I haven't gotten to a trapping quest which does require you to trap and capture the object. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I'm like, I don't want to trap these things. I want to kill them. I'm going to hit them with my beat stick till they can't get up anymore. So that's exactly how optional traps are. Now, on the other hand... A lot of experienced hunters bring traps, even if they're not going to trap the monster, simply because trapping is an op is an uh, opportunity for free damage, essentially. But that's you know that, again, that's more an equipment based thing than a than a talent based thing. And if you think that trap sense doesn't fit, like I said, more than willing to axe it. Um, I got th I got thrown off for a second because trap sense is technically a class feature of rogues, not a not a talent, but. <laughs> Um, True. But, Excuse me. <laughs> the features and talents kind of blend into one here, because um, I know that one of the class features of Rogue is going to feature in at least five weapons. Mm -hmm. So, let me let me make sure. I didn't want that as a subtitle. I wanted that as a title. Okay, so let me put that in. So I just, the... I just put... okay. So. And as far as far as as far as pairing, as and with each with each of these, I'm still I'm still putting it that so, that if somebody wanted to get the um, feats for them, that that would be something they'd have to spend their feat slots on. Yes, I'm going with the very basics. I uh, I saw the feats. I said, oh, those feats are kind of cool, but I kept them out of consideration when can when looking at the basic formation of the of the talent or feature. All right, that makes sense. Now, the next 
required uh, power, I guess we'll call it, since I've been mixing up features and talents apparently, <laughs> um, is a class talent of the rogue. I'm, I'm, I'm double checking to make sure. Yes, it's a class talent. It's tumble. Every hunter has the ability to roll away with their weapon out. Every hunter can roll or hop or somehow move a large distance as a dodge, even with their uh, weapon out. It, you know, and I understand that mechanically that's a disengage. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're getting away from the monster, so the monster does not hit you. Um, so... Tumble is, is, is universal to all hunters. <laughs> yep. So let's... So what's next? The last two skills... And again, feel free to veto these if we just want to say, oh, well, it's a class feature that Monster, Hunter can, Monster Hunters can just do this. Mm -hmm. Are from uh, 13 True Ways. And it's the Commander class... get to that list because apparently it reset my view um, so of the commander's talents the only two that even fit a monster hunter um, and make sense as part of a monster hunter are armor skills and martial training uh, armor skills, you take no attack penalties for fighting in heavy armor. Uh, and this is true in Monster Hunter. You can fight and hit just as easily with your with your weapon in the leather armor as you can in the Uragon armor, which looks like extremely ornate plate armor that's literally inches thick. Although, when it comes to that, would... would... Should it be a case where they where they have that, or is, or should they have should they have it that they that they don't that um the that the that um the ability to use heavy armor is intrinsic to class? Because on one hand, I can I can see it that that I don't that the talent doesn't need to be in there. We can just put that in for the for when it comes to the weapons and armor section of the hunter class. The uh, on the other hand, um. And actually, actually, given some of the feats for armor skills, that one I might have to I might have to just veto because some of them are not going to are not going to fit. Fit, yeah. Like okay, say, yeah. So what what was the other one? Uh, martial training, where you do not take an attack penalty when fighting with heavy or martial weapons. Same thing yeah. applies. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah, I, I put them because, again, I was not considering the feats at the time, just the basics. Mm -hmm. So that means that we've got a list of five universal uh, powers, two of which are optional. Yes. And I think that's a lot more balanced than what I originally had. I really appreciate that. Um, nice. But So un unless, I missed, unless I missed one, we have, for universal talents, we have Fearless, Tracker, Trap Sense, Tumble... And for op for optional, we have Animal Companion. I feel like I missed one. Trap Sense wasn't optional because Trap Sense is uh, equipment based. If you don't bring the trap, Trap Sense wouldn't necessarily apply. Um, that if you want to keep it as just a, a straight universal. Yeah, um, I did. I did, but I I feel like I feel like there's one that I forgot to put in. Nope, it's those five. All, All right. So because because those are intrinsic to being a hunter. Mm -hmm. So taking the, taking all that into account, we'll start we'll start with the we'll start with the melee uh, we weapon. Before we before we start before we start with any um with any en with any en with any of the weapon entries, we do need to set up the um hunter class. Now. I do think that the that some that some of the advancement setups that are used in the fighter make for a very good starting framework. What with its hit its hit points rate, its feet its feet rate, and its um talent rate. It's also good because of the um 
the maneuvers can cover some of the more advanced things that hunters can do with their weapons. Mm -hmm. So you, you're thinking of keeping the man, keeping the maneuver pool and, and 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 leveled maneuver pool that um the that the fighter has. I'm thinking of maybe limiting it. I'm not sure that eight maneuvers is going to be anything more than giving monster hunters even more than they're already going to get. Um, I think I think it should probably cap out at around six maneuvers. And while I haven't taken a good look at all of the maneuvers, um, the the maneuvers, some of these maneuvers may never apply, especially with how monster hunters fight. Um, there although is one, there is one, th there's a couple of changes that I'm, that I'm th that I'm thinking of making. Um, one of th one of them is w is um in is in reg in regard to. Because the the reason why I think it go it's going with that rate of maneuver increases so that there's something that you're getting at every level. Okay, I can see that. Um, um and a lot of the first level maneuvers are things that you do as a monster hunter all the time. Uh, carve an opening, deadly assaults. Uh, heavy blows, precision attack, second shot, shield, bash, two weapon pressure. Those are all things that are intrinsic to even weapons. Well, if keep, you... keep in mind that there's nothing stopping us from using maneuvers from using using maneuver like effects from other classes as maneuvers. Yes, I, I'm absolutely sure of that. And uh, but just the the maneuvers in the in the list for fighter itself. Almost all of them are things that I have, in some way, shape, or form, seen uh, seen happen with uh, with actual monster hunter mechanics. Um, a perfect example in fifth level maneuvers: hero's skill. Um, this looks like it. It's a maneuver that makes it so that you'll still hit just not with as much damage there is one there is one thing that I am that I am going to that I'm going to change though and that's mm. the that's the whole thing with class talents instead of doing the whole you get a fourth one at um at sixth level I mm -hmm. want I want to use the rate I want to use the rate that's used for um, barbarians. So they okay. they get an they get an additional one at fifth and eighth. I I can agree with that definitely. Um, but the fighter the fighter is basically a great template to build the hunter on. Mm -hmm. Um, especially with things like uh the total amount of feats that gives a, a nice amount of flexibility. Um. Reminds me a lot of, say, armor skills from the game. Giving those additional uh, feats to add to stuff. And any of the uh, particular uh, level up ability bonuses just remind me of advancing in the actual game to where uh, you get armor that automatically gives you more health when you, when you wear its armor skills and stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's definitely a... It's definitely a uh, a fantastic template to use. Yeah. Now, beyond the, I've already got the the initial chart set up, and the and of course and of course that also that that also means that that it has the re the re the requisite rate of um of hit point increase. Which is usually which the formula for hit points is at the start it's eight plus con mod times three, mm -hmm. which I'd say is a um I'd say that I'd say that's a de that's a decent framework to go by. Yeah. Um. 
Um, especially, uh, again, every everything here in this particular tree, uh, as a as a baseline, looks very much like a um, a mon you know a, something a monster hunter would would go through as they become a more more and more veteran hunter. Mm -hmm. Especially with um, once you hit level eight and start getting the epic feats, that that reminds me very much of hitting G rank. Uh, or master rank in Monster Hunter, and getting you know your really cool weapons and armor with their really high damage and and skills, and getting some of the better armor skills in the game. Um, so this this entire progression definitely reminds me of low rank, high rank, G rank. Now, as far now as far as. As far as the as far as the uh, the modifiers beyond the chart, um, what should the ability bonus go to? Should it be a case of pi of pick plus two to one as long as it's not one from your racial bonus? Uh or should it be um, strength and con the way it, the way it is in, for the fighter? I think strength and con. No, no, I think it should be a choice between strength, con, and dex. Mainly because of the ranged weapons such as the bow guns and bow, and the more dex dexterity based weapons such as dual blades. So, what I've got what I've got it written as is ability bonus plus two to strength, constitution, or dexterity different from as lo different from racial bonus. I.e., if you pick if you pick. If you picked plus two to strength for your race, you can't pick plus two to strength for your class. Correct. Which is which is why, as I mentioned a while back, when Wizards of the Coast was doing the whole, we're gonna let people pick which which ability modifiers go go to go to which instead of having each race ha have it set. And I'm like, um, for one, I'm not giving I'm not giving you a cookie for something that you for for you fixing a problem you already had a solution to years ago. Because the because the whole thing was focused on them wanting a cookie for getting rid of mine, getting rid of ability subtraction modif modifiers for um, races in 5e, and I'm like, 4e fixed this problem in 2008. You don't get a cookie. If anything, you should be giving Rob Heinso a gift basket. Mm-hmm. Um, now initiative is Dex mod plus level. I don't think you're going to be changing that. Nah, no need to. Um. Armor? Not unless you meant. I mean, uh, skill checks always change that anyway. Like if you're sneaking up or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, armor class. I'm pretty sure you're still going to go with the whole base plus middle mod of Condex Wiz um, per plus level. Yep. Um. Although um, the armor class where it says shield and heavy armor, um, that's actually going to depend on. Which weapon? Uh, that 16, I would say, would be the shield from Sword and Shield, which is the smallest shield in the game. I do. Um, all, any shield... In core, in 13th Age's core rules, any shield that you have just, get, just gives a plus one to AC. I think in this, I think in this case, we would have to, spec we would have to specify, and I'm going, I'm going to excise that and put, and put that in as a default when we get to certain weapons. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a good idea. Um, because not all shields in Monster Hunter are created equal. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of blocking ability, it goes lance, gun lance and charge blade, sword and shield, and then great sword, which can be used as a shield as part of as as like part of a maneuver. Essentially, you can block with the great sword. Mm -hmm. So, and now physical and mental defense. I'm guess I'm guessing you're gonna have that formula be the same. Yeah, because your physical and mental defenses are going to be most affected by armor skills, things that give you bonuses against your statuses and your elements. Mm -hmm. Um, hit points. We already covered that. Um, yep. Are you gonna have recoveries nine? Or are you thinking of modifying that? Um, I don't know uh, exactly how 
powerful a recovery will be compared to how the potions work in the game. Um, well, it are recovered. A I see the recovery dice there. Okay. Yeah. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an average of of uh, six times level plus con mod. Um. Oh yeah, you're t you're talking average. Sorry, I had to, I had to correct myself. Um, yeah. Because it's one d ten. I will admit um, sometimes I have a house ruled it to be j to to have recoveries work like healing surges in fourth, where it's one quarter of your max. Which would be that? See that, and that's that's the that's the um, problem I have here with uh, with now consolidating monster hunters mechanics with a tabletop. Because Monster Hunter has, uh, when you take damage, you take two types of damage at the same time. You take actual damage and you take recoverable damage. And actual damage takes takes the, the health bar all the way down to a point on the green part of the health bar. But the recoverable damage then leaves a red section behind that slowly ticks back up, so long as you don't take another hit. Um, I honestly, th honestly think, th I honestly think that. It's not the first time that we that we've seen this that we've seen that particular kind of approach. Obviously, Bloodborne does it, and uh -huh. uses it in different ways. Um, every 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 major fighting game that I've played in the in the last in the last several years has some form of it. Uh -huh. Um. And and it was and it was especially brought to the forefront with um, Street Fighter Four, which, which is, is another Capcom game, and that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But the but I honest I honestly think that's something that doesn't work at that doesn't work as well in um, tabletop because for all in for all intents and purposes you're asking people to track two different types of hit points but mm -hmm. not at the same time mm -hmm. the only the only way I can see it working is if you is if you um fiddle around with the vitality wound approach. And honestly, I'm honestly um, the vitality wound system. I always I always felt is better is better served for games that are going for a bit more grit. This isn't. It's right. not. <laughs> so I, I don't think we need to consider the recoverable damage then. No. Um, and, sen and since we have the whole rec we have the whole recovery system, um, it it would be re it would we'd be gimmicking a gimmick. Um. Honestly, I'd go with your house rule of a recovery record uh, restores quarter damage, quarter total max damage or total max health, um, because that's about the amount that a potion will restore when you've got the full 150 health in the game. Um, I don't know how we'll fi factor in mega potions, but that's a, a, a uh, another thing for another time. Maybe that's more an equipment thing at that point. Yeah. <clears throat> I could I could easily just I could easily just finagle it as twenty five percent plus one d t plus one d six per level. Yeah, and that's again something that we can consider at the equipment end of things. I'm not even sure um, if I'd go if I'd go with that. I'm just saying there's a possibility. Um, yeah. Backgrounds don't need to go don't need to go in that. That's self explanatory. I kind of everybody to... everybody's a hunter. <laughs> yep. Um, I would actually. If I was if I was writing this as a full book, I would probably write a side box saying do not saying do not put why you shouldn't put hunter as one of your backgrounds because that's ki that's kind of redundant and it's um it would be a case where you'd have a background that's too useful because the thing about backgrounds as you probably saw is that it it's basically Thirteenth Ages version of cl of um skills mm -hmm. but treated a lot more broadly. Yeah. Hey guys, just a heads up. The whiskey's starting to hit me, and this is out of my wheelhouse, so I'm gonna let you guys go for it. All, all, right, all right, Doku, stay frosty. Um, thanks, thanks for giving it a shot. Yeah, man. If if I had something to contribute, I'd try to stick around, but I think this is mostly gonna be you two guys. So until next time, guys. Peace out. Later, Mildred. Later's in. See ya. So, as far as icon relationships, um, I'd say we keep that, but. Re but reboot the icons because half of them aren't gonna because there's only a handful of them that could I could that I could see working 
and the other and the other ones have way too much baggage. Um, there because Archmage out. Um, the, like, let me actually let me um. I need to, I need to I need to I need to refresh my list on on the icons so I can see which ones could actually work. The Archmage, no. The Crusader, maybe. The Diabolist, no. The Dwarf King, maybe. Um, the Elf Queen, no. I'm not saying that because of my racism against elves. Mostly. Yeah. <laughs> the Emperor, probably. The Great Gold Worm, no. The High Druid, probably not. The Lich King, absolutely not. The Orc Lord, absolutely not. The Priestess, probably not. At, le at least not at least not in the di very direct sense. Um, the Prince of Shadows, no. And the three, no fucking way. <laughs> Like the only one I can I could I can see here, um, is the Dwarf King, and the Emperor. Like the only ones I can see that would actually apply would be the Dwarf King and the Emperor. With something like this, I'm I'm far more inclined. I don't want I don't want to get rid of the icon system because I like I like the icon system. I think it's very very good for helping establish character. Mm -hmm. Especially it's basically this game's replacement for alignments. It's just that instead mm -hmm. of alignment you have the whole you've got a positive relationship with an icon, a negative relationship or a conflicted one and how that's interpreted is up to the GM and the players. Yeah. I find I find that's far more engaging than the nine alignment chart, which um, is perfectly fine if you're dealing with the co cosmic forces of order and chaos. But if you're but if you're not, it has problems. And which when when you try and use it as a morality system, it has more problems. Which is what that's the reason I've always been critical of the alignment system. Not for not for the reasons that certain stupid people have been critical of it. Hold on, you said the great gold worm. No. However, I would say the Great Gold Worm, yes, looking closer at it. Only because of the fact that uh, with the lore uh, introduced in Monster Hunter World, we're introduced to the story of the Sapphire Star and how the, the five scales of the five great dragons created the world. And, and that with the guidance of the Sapphire Star, the people continued to protect the world. So, as, as you know, he's the inspiration for Holy Orders of Paladins and independent heroes, which is very much what the Hunters are. The Hunters Guild is a collection of people who are like, I'm going to go out and hunt monsters to make sure that everybody else is safe. These are all independent people coming from various walks of life, joining the Guild and fighting monsters. <laughs> So there's, I, I would say the Great Gold Worm could apply, but again, the, it, three out of what, thirteen? Uh, yeah, because <laughs> you know, thirteenth age and the number thirteen and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, I three out of thirteen is is, de is definitely we need to rework maybe a new icon system or new sets of icons. Um, especially, especially, especially since the ones that survived, um. The whole the whole point with the icon system is what is the fact that it's not just that individual icon, but also the people that represent that icon. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has a positive icon with the pre with the priestess, that also has the implication that they're going to be able to get on well with members of any church. Mm -hmm. Well, members of any good church, obviously. God's light. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um. And as let's see, da, 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 da. and as far as let's see, feats don't don't really need to change don't really need to change that. Um, yeah. Let's see, then when when it comes to when it comes to um ar when it comes to armor, 
Um, I'm guessing I'm guessing you'd have it stay you'd have it stay the same with the base ACs. Ten for no armor, thirteen for light, fifteen for heavy. Um, yeah, especially since we can see uh, disparities in the defense stats of armors within the game depending on their their build. In fact, the leather armor does have a lower defense than say the alloy armor. Uh, so yes, 10, 10, 10, 13, 15 is definitely a good uh, spread there. Mm -hmm. Especially since some um, 13th age is not a game that is re that is really really cares about the minutia. Um, the reason I didn't cover shields when it comes to the whole armor thing is is again that's something that should be tackled for spe for more specific cases. Yes, and in fact. Um, that's why the the minutia applies on the weapons themselves. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the entry that it has for weapons, how do you feel about the di about the die types that it gives? Uh, okay. Let me find that real quick. Um. So, the real problem is there isn't going to be anything light or simple or even small uh, i i can absolutely tell you right now all of the weapons hunters uh wield are either heavy or martial whether it's melee or ranged so uh, so it's so no matter what it's no matter what it's going to be it's going to be d8s or d10s yes and for example putting uh, a D8 on longsword is good. Now, Warhammer, it's talking about um, the actual archetypal one-handed Warhammer. It's not talking about what ham is in in Monster Hunter. Most weapons are two-handed in Monster Hunter as well, so they'd be at a 1D10 um, rather than a 1D8. Mm -hmm. And with, with the ranged weapons... Um, With the ranged weapons, I'd actually, uh, under heavy or martial, um, I'd up heavy crossbow to a 1d10, because the heavy bow gun fires the slowest, but also does the most damage. Yeah. Instead of um, putting in heavy and mar heavy and martial, I, I, wrote it in at, I wrote it in as um, hunter arms, one-handed, two-handed. One two -handed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh. With with hunter with ranged hunter arms, we only have three. But um, the spread for the, for them is actually a very specific progression. Um, light bow gun and bow tend to do the same amount of damage, so the one d eight, and heavy bow gun does more but fires slower. Thus, the one d ten. So that's the way I'd spread that there. I'm writing it as, um, as light bow gun, heavy bow gun, and bow. Yeah, light bow light bow gun does d8, heavy bow gun does d10, bow does d8. One d8, and then one. You said light bow gun does d8, heavy bow gun does d10. Yep. And Bo does D eight. Correct. Like this is this is we're we're fighting in the big leagues here. <laughs> this, there's nothing there's nothing to be to be uh said more than that. <laughs> Alright, no, and once again I'll write that as I should notice as far as, as far as cross classing, I would pro I would probably I would probably have it that it, that um anybody who anybody who's not a hunter who tries to pick up a hunter arm is go is going to, is going to need to is going to need to have at least a strength of eighteen before they can even wield the thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would say that. If I was using a different system, I would say that all of these count under exotic weapon proficiency. Uh, or, um, even better, if not a trained hunter, you get a neg four to all attack rolls with it. 
either a neg four or this would be one of the rare cases where using some using something like five e disadvantage would be um applicable mm -hmm. especially if you're using ranged weapons because have you ever tried have you ever tried to fire a bow have you ever tried to draw a bow without having proper arm strength and proper chest strength yes I remember the first time I picked up an actual English longbow and tried to shoot it. Did you end up hitting your Did you end up hitting yourself in the face with the string? No, I ended up hitting myself in the wrist instead. Whether whether you know, that's worse the, is debatable. Oh, it was worse. I dropped the bow. It made my entire tendon go uh go numb. <laughs> yeah, but eventually. Eventually, I got strong enough to pull that fucking 100 kg draw. Now, I'm, you didn't put it in as one of the universals, but I am, I am think, I am thinking that, um, th that threatening should be a should be a universal feature for any, um, any melee build. Um, there is. A reason that I didn't. Monsters can disengage and just run. And they run way faster than you because they're giant. Yep. Some of them even just fly away. Um, my, my, my reason for not making threatening a, a universal feature was monsters, when they disengage, they... They, they usually hit you first and then run, or they roar to stun you and then run. And as such, you know you're already stunned, grabbed, or otherwise incapable of making an, a, an AOO. Um, it, it would be super, and I mean super niche for this to actually ever apply at any point, and even then. It doesn't tend to stop a monster from running away. Mm. They go full. They go full route to, to when they zone. So yeah, um, I am putting the I'm putting the soul class feature as hunting style. I you pick at character creation. You pick what you pick one. You pick one hunting style. You can you can switch between you can switch between hunting st hunting styles um, during during re during rest or or um, prep phases. Mm hmm. Because the the whole thing with the whole thing when it comes to this setup is that it is that is that we are go, we are going through the a three phase setup. You ha you have you have the hub phase, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. where you're you're going around get, take, taking care of the small taking care of the downtime activities before mm -hmm. you before you pick up your next job. Then you then you've got then you've got camp. You know where where you're. Pr I'd, I would say that I would say that the meal is going to be part of is going to be part of the camp phase because, well, fuck it, this may be your last meal ever, so you may as well you may as well enjoy it. Yep. Um. Plus, I'm, plus, I'm pr I'm pretty sure pal, much like how ogres make great chefs in Warhammer, I'm, I I'm not surprised that palicos make great chefs in Monster Hunter. <laughs> it's it's more than that. Um. <clears throat> Especially with the newest game, uh, you're not you're not eating a meal in the newest game. <laughs> you're eating dessert. In Rise, you eat mitarashi dango as your canteen as your canteen meal. For anybody not in the know, dango are small uh, spheres of mochi, which is a glutinous rice cake. Uh, very sweet, very popular in Japan, and uh, anybody who's seen mochi ice cream here in the States knows that it's the outer skin around the ice cream. Um, that are flavored with both internal flavorings and syrups on the outside, and, and sometimes toppings such as sesame seeds or other such uh, small things. And then put on skewers, and you eat them off the skewer. Mm -hmm. um, mitarashi dango is the most common form of this. And that's your canteen meal in Rise. In previous games, you'd get a cooking animation, and then you'd get this giant spread of like meats and stews and bread and 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 uh, veggies and everything. Nope, nope. This game, you just eat uh, four sticks of dango. 
Now, on one hand, it certainly fits the whole weeb thing, but there's a small part of me that's gonna that's gonna miss watching the what watching the um watching the chefs reenact a meal at medieval times. You're not going to miss it because the dongo is all a ninja display. <laughs> I will take your word for that, but uh, is... you you will love it. I also um. I found that the animation for the canteen is one I, one I can't skiff because of how adorable it is, but that's just me. Ah. Um, but when now, the reason the reason why I, the reason why I'm doing this whole thing of letting people be able to, sw to be able to switch out their loadouts is I don't want anybody to um, de to deal with choice paranoia. Mm -hmm. I I de Ideally, you sh ideally you should be encouraged to experiment. Mhm. Mm Just like you are in the real Monster Hunter. Because in the real Monster Hunter, you can switch to any weapon you want at any time for any reason. Forge any weapon you want. You're not ever locked out. Mhm. Mm the only uh, limitation is how familiar you are with the weapon. <laughs> so uh be careful what you wish for people. Well, this weapon's too slow. I'm going to try dual blades. Why am I all the way on the other side of the monster? Why can't I stay right beside it? That is an experience I have literally heard over my headphones more than once. Yeah, well... <laughs> um, maybe it's just me, but I have, I have to wonder if... I have to... I know that Monster Hunter Rise is, tr is trying to be full... is trying to be full on... is trying to be full on weeb shit, but... I have to... but... Given given that a certain uh, given that a certain other massive massive handheld franchise is go is going back to weeb elements, I have to wonder if they were drawing upon the same part of Japan. Uh, I don't know. Because um, Pokemon Legends is what is what I was referring to, and I found out about yeah. that around the same time as I did Rise. And Legends is going back to Sino, which is heavily inspired by um, Hokkaido. Hokkaido, yeah. As is uh, as is Kamuda and its ninja village hidden in the mountains. So, <laughs> I don't, I don't think Capcom's ever going to confirm whether that's the case. But if they did, I would. If they did, I'd, I'd, I would simply nod and say, yeah, that makes sense. Rise has been in development longer than Pokemon Legends Arceus has, so if anything, uh, it's probably a happy Rise, accident. It is a happy accident because Rise was in development at the same time World was before World came out. Like it was developing near the end of World's development cycle because they have two teams. So plus that plus that that on that doesn't surprise me either because a lot a lot of times. To maintain to maintain staff, they'll have people working on other stuff, even if that other stuff doesn't actually um, come to pass. When a, when a given project goes gold, simply mm -hmm. so you don't have staff going, well, I'm, well, I'm done, so I may as well just fuck off and go to another stu go to another studio. Exactly. Um. But starting with the starting with the melee styles, the first one that we have is great sword. Yes. So. Uh, first, a small overview of Great Sword from the actual games. Great Sword is your archetypal. I am guts from Berserk. I am Siegfried Stoffen from Soul Calibur. I am the guy with the giant sword on my back. Fear me, hit you, big numbers weapon. Uh, it's a fairly simple weapon. You've got a lot of wide swinging attacks. Um, it can be used as a shield at times, but the big thing that comes to great sword most is its charge system you can charge up each hit in the charge combo it, it, uh, culminating in an in a final hit called the true charge and this is all about timing and knowing the monster great sword is very easy to pick up very hard to master and that is actually the case with most weapons in Monster Hunter, as you'll find out as we go on. Mm -hmm. So Now, <laughs> because of that, uh, Greatsword actually has quite a few um, talents 
and features split across uh, everything here. Well, I know that. Go we'll ahead. start with um. Ta we'll start with talents. So, starting with barbarian. So this is this is all the way up the top. Um, this is. I, I know that this is a. Uh, going to be an interesting area to put in here, especially considering that this is an epic talent, technically. Uh, and that is... Or, or No, excuse me. No, this is an adventure talent. I had this labeled wrong. Excuse me. So, the first talent that Greatsword has from Barbarian is Whirlwind. Um... As I said, lots of wide sweeping attacks. There is a specific attack that that slashes the the uh, greatsword all around the hunter in a large circle. So I was like, whirlwind attack. You you can take out packs of mooks with this, and you can and you can even hit multiple monsters with it. All all right. And whirlwind, well, you take a minus four penalty to your AC and PD until the start of your next turn and roll a separate melee attack against each enemy you're engaged with, you deal no miss damage. Um, I'm probably going to excise the um, and get the engagement rule on it. Yeah. You need... They just need to be within reach for this to work. <laughs> I've, so... never, I've never been... A, I was never a fan of... The, I was never a fan of that, of that particular um, ruling anyways. Mm -hmm. um, lar yep. Large... Large... Largely because the reason somebody's taking Whirlwind is because they want to do the Link style spin attack, and oftentimes that oftentimes that's as much of, that's as much about um, about threat than it is about than it is about actually being surrounded. In fact, if you're in fact if you have if you're pl if you're playing things smart, you shouldn't be in a situation where you're where you're engaged with multiple enemies at once. Mm -hmm. Um. Or if you're a good hunter, you're fight, you're fighting all three monsters at the same time and taking them out around the same point. <laughs> Hi, Team Dark Star. <laughs> Let's see. We we won't get into those speed those speed runners. They are super talented, and I always look at them and go, I wish I had the time to play like that. <laughs> um, I am making it. Th I am making it that the whirlwind has to be the first action of your turn, so solely so that um. One of the epic feats can actually apply. That being, you can use whirlwind any time during your turn, not just the first action. Yeah, I can see that. Um, one of one of the epic feats was you can use it on thrown weapons, which is just that. Which one is ridiculous, and two, um, nobody's going to be throwing their great swords, so that's out. True. All right. What Very you, true. What what talent do you have next? check my list uh, the next the next one I have is down in fighter um, and I don't think this is technically a talent hold on this might be one of the maneuvers uh, no this is a talent then I guess mm -hmm. okay yeah uh, power attack. Once per battle, before you roll an attack, you can declare you're using power attack to deal additional damage with that attack roll. Uh, if the attack hits, you deal the following additional damage. Um, I'm th I'm looking at power attack as a form of the charged attack on the weapon. Because, as I said, one of the things that it does is you can charge up your hit before you hit with it to do more damage. Um, and so... I don't know how I'd want to modify that because it does make you stationary when it comes to the uh, the great sword. If you start charging your attack, you're standing still. Um, and it does way more damage. I would pro I would probably I would probably mod the the thing that I would mod is the timing. I.e., when it's your turn, you declare power attack, but you don't act, but you don't actually do the roll until the end of the initiative count. Okay. That makes sense. So, you're asen you're essentially declaring that you're going to go last just to do power attack. Yeah. 
I can see that. Some other um, other instances that have that have used power attack have done the whole you take it you take a mot you take a um, penalty to your defense to boost attack. Yeah. Um. There is tech there. There is the there is the restrictor of once per battle when it comes to when it comes to how it works in core, but I don't think that would really work. Yeah, I um, I think by taking out the once per battle and instead putting in at the end of the initiative, uh, you act at the end of the initiative count would be the a good trade off. So. Um, and as far as it dealing what, um, I feel like you'd prob should you, should the die be bumped? Um, yeah, D6 and D8 instead of D4 and D6 would make more sense. And D8, which also means that I, I'm guessing that for the epic, the epic feat that should be bumped up to D8 and D10. Yeah. Because that would imply that you've got um, the focus feat, which allows you to charge up faster and throw it out harder. Yep. Uh, or the, the focus armor skill. All right. Although, given given how we changed power attack, how would that affect one of the one of the champion feats? Is one battle per day you can use power attack twice? Um. I would say that with the uh, with the champion feat, one battle per day, you can apply power attack damage twice. So you, you declare power attack, and you're saying I'm using... Essentially, this would be the true charge attack, because it applies even more damage than a normal charge attack. And, and so you'd, you'd declare, I'm using true power attack, true charge, whatever we're going we're gonna to call it. Um, and so it would apply the additional d10. You'd get two d10 applied instead of one. Yeah. And as far as, as far as the adventurer feat, I don't think we need to change that. Correct. Yeah. That that feat. That's feat. That feat's fine. Mm -hmm. Next talent. So the next talent for great sword. Uh, <laughs> so this is the thing about some of the weapons being really uh, simple. Great sword essentially only has those out of the talents that I could find. Some some weapons have a lot more talents than others because of all of the mechanics behind them in the game. Um, if you want to suggest other things to add at this point, that's that's where I really wanted your help with all of this. Yeah, with with some of them, I'm with some of them. I might have to I have to go through my expanded list and and and, and handle that myself. And I'm not going to do that on this show because that's get, that is a long term project. Yeah, that's like that's like a few days. Mm -hmm. But with what we have in core, this is what I could find that said this is greatsword. Yeah. This is what greatsword is about. Um. When it came to when it came to maneuvers or maneuver or maneuver equivalents for non-fighter classes, were there any that stuck out to you for greatsword? Uh, with the maneuvers, um, brace for it because that's the block with the greatsword from from a uh, from like half of half of the blo half of the maneuvers in the fighter pool could all apply. Uh, Brace for it, carve an opening, uh, heavy blows. Um, let me see. Uh, hack and slash would also work because, again, of the of the way that how wide the swings for great sword are. Um, punish them. These these are a lot of these maneuvers apply to numerous weapons, and as as such, uh, it's a uh, 
it's hard to say this is just great swords big thing but the, these when these maneuvers came, just in fighter um when it came to maneuvers did you write a universal list or did you um did you write separate lists for um weapons i i didn't take uh i didn't i didn't really have the time to drill down into maneuvers this is this is more uh i'm i'm slightly winging it at this point i i got gotcha. um i think when it com i think when it comes to maneuvers that's something i that's something i'll try and handle on my own okay um talents is what i want to is what i want to focus on f for the purposes of this um and that's and I, what I focused on. And as well. I, I will note that if that if I was able to commission somebody to do it, I would probably set up a custom, a custom character sheet that ha that where um there's a, there's an entire page dedicated to, um, set to separate loadouts, like ha like having mm. three columns set up with three different loadouts. I eat here's here's the weapon style, here's the weapon that you're using, here's its weapon effects, and here's the talents and feats that are that you're using with that one. So that is so that it's easy for people to um, mix and mix and what they want to what they want to and not yeah um, not fall not fall into the trap of using of using just one, just one type. Um, let's let's go full weeb long sword. Long sword again starts with whirlwind, um, and you're going to find <laughs> that half of the weapons have whirlwind. Half of all the fourteen weapons have a whirlwind. Um, especially longsword. Longswords are actually longer than most great swords, and their primary mode of attack, the spirit combo, ends in a giant round slash. It's it's outright world. <laughs> okay, but let's address the um before we get into the other towns. Let's address the elephant in the room when it comes to when it comes to something like longsword. The spirit how, gauge. Yes. How are we, how would you handle the spirit gauge? Okay, so this is getting a little ahead of myself. Um, when it came to weapons that have a charging gauge mechanic, those are five weapons. Dual blades, long sword, switch axe, charge blade, and insect glaive. Of the, f of the five of these, four of these all charge when you're hitting the enemy. So... The way I dealt with things like the spirit uh, gauge is rogue's momentum. Because momentum builds as you hit or get hit and allows you to do specific maneuvers. Um, as, a, as, a, as an addendum to that, all five of these weapons also have modes where you spend that gauge as part of the mode and so the uh, the pair with that momentum is then swashbuckle um so momentum is dual is is longsword building up um the spirit gauge with its hits against the enemy swashbuckle is the spirit combo that allows them to increase the uh, level of their sword or the spirit helm splitter which allows them to launch themselves into the air and come down with a really hard chop things of that nature mm -hmm. that is how i dealt with the gauges for these five weapons yeah so let's see with with momentum it's a case of you gain momentum by hitting with an attack you lose when you are hit Mm -hmm. The default is that you can use momentum powers without losing momentum. Um, Except we, for in the case of Swashbuckle, which requires you to spend momentum to use it. Mm -hmm. Which is oh. exactly... that. When I saw those two, and I saw exactly how they work together, I was, I was outright along the line of, that's these five weapons entirely. That's their core mechanics entirely. Now... When it comes to the when it comes to the whole momentum powers thing, that's something I'd have to handle on my own, and I'm not even and I, and it's something that I'd probably sim I'd probably greatly simplify instead of ha instead of having those those um those charge based ones have their own list of momentum powers. 
because we want to use it, we want to have everything fall under the cate under the category of maneuvers. I would pro I would probably ha I would probably have it that mo that momentum is used so is used solely for um for charges. Mm -hmm. Um one of the potential ways you could use it is to cheat um flexible attacks, i.e. Your die your die result counts un counts under a given flexible attack even if it did even if it didn't. Mm -hmm. So if you rolled a seven and you need a and you need a natural twenty for a for a certain flexible attack, it counts, but you're not getting a critical. Yeah. Um. And I I can probably I can probably put that in the other. So long sword is long, long sword is one. Mm -hmm. What were the, what were the other ones you said you were giving uh, momentum to? Dual blades, because going into demon mode builds up the arch demon gauge, and arch demon gives you a new set of maneuvers and attacks to use. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the reason I include switch axe in here is because even though you don't build the switch axe gauge by hitting things, and it builds on its own. It still has to gauge your spending when you're in sword mode. Yeah. Um, so Not I... to mention that when you hit things while in sword mode, you build the amp gauge. The way I was thinking of simplifying this is any, any hit builds the amp gauge, and then you can do the amped attacks that the switch axe has. That, that was my thought. Was that was how you would how you deal with with the mo the momentum in there because the automatically tracking gauge and the gauge going down in sword mode uh, isn't it, it's it's too it's it's too much tracking for what we're trying to go for. Mm -hmm. So my my thing is it, you can switch between axe mode and sword mode willy nilly freely. That's that's fluff. That's flavor. Um, what happens is when you build up your momentum, you eventually hit amped mode, and you get the, all these extra goodies you can play around with. Which is essentially what we're doing by giving a a, uni a, a simplified maneuver list from momentum in the first place anyway. And then what I was specifically thinking of swashbuckle being is the what's called the zero-sum element discharge for switch axe. And we'll get into that when we get to the switch axe. Um... The third, the or the the fourth weapon is charge blade because you literally charge the vials by hitting enemies and then put them into the sword or the shield. And then I was just thinking again, instead of oh I'm putting it in the sword or the shield, it's oh I've charged the charge blade now it has a charged shield, and that's part of uh, again that's gonna, that's going to build into its momentum based uh, additional talents and such. Mm -hmm. And then insect glaive because with insect glaive. You use the kinsect to hit a monster, collect an essence, and give yourself additional powers. And again, maneuver list and swashbuckle for things like pole vaulting with the insect glaive. So let me. So. Longsword, think... dual blades, switch axe, charge blade. Insect Glaive. All right. Those five are the five weapons that, in some way, shape, or form, have a meter or gauge that is affected by any enemy engagement directly. And so I've I've finagled a few things, and I'll discuss those in more length when we get to the other weapons. Yeah. Now, but for long for long sword, this enables your your extra damage spirit combo, or or you know your your helm splitter, which is all going to be. You know stuff that you'd probably define with swashbuckle. Yep. And then some additional maneuvers that you'll come up with independently. Mm -hmm. All right. Now. So, so now um, were the were so for getting back to longsword, were um momentum and swashbuckle the only and whirlwind the only talents you could think of for that would no. Be, no, else? there's 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 uh. Let me look here. One more. And it's a defining trait of the longsword now and has been since world. Counterattack from uh, fighter class talents. Alright, let me get back up to fighter and talents. Okay. 
Okay, count counter attack. Um Hang on. Okay. Excuse me. Let's see, once per round when the escalation die is even and an enemy misses you with a natural odd melee attack roll, you can make a basic melee attack dealing half damage against that enemy as a free action. Um do you do you intend on keeping counterattack in the in the same way or are or are you go are you going to are you going to so um so once per round makes sense mm -hmm. um and we can finagle a little bit with this counterattack uh Longsword has multiple counterattack stances it takes in the game. But again, that's all fluff in this case since we're using a, a theater of the mind tabletop or a theater of the mind combat style with this tabletop. Um, there can be a counterattack, and then there can be a spend momentum for this type of counterattack added to that because it does have a feature in the games where you can spend your spirit gauge to get a, a special type of counter. Um and so, with with it as is right now, I think that's fine for a normal counterattack, because the normal counterattack uh, stances in the game are basically like that. Um, well, they're more they're more. You wait for the enemy to almost hit you, and then you swing, and that's your counterattack. Yeah. Uh, but you know, but again, mind's eye. Um, as for the feats, uh, having the adventure feat being that it deals full damage, perfectly fine. Um, making the champion feat so that you can use it once per turn instead of once per round, um, that would that would also be perfectly fine. And then now you can use the counter attack when the escalation die is three plus. <laughs> so you're telling me you're telling me you know most of the time, sure. Uh, all those feats are fine, mm -hmm. but with the base with the base counter attack as is, um. The only thing I would say, because I don't know if the addendum at the end there, this attack can't use any limited abilities or flexible attack maneuvers, would that prevent the counterattack from also generating momentum, or would momentum still be generated nonetheless? I am. I am prob. When it comes to when it comes to the, I'm actually considering getting rid of that whole. When it comes to the whole limited abilities, the only things that could, the flexible attack part, I'm. Considering getting rid of that for the purposes of this, the limited abilities part, I'm considering keeping. Okay. So and things so, like things like per, per battle or per day can't can't be used. Yeah. Okay. Then momentum would still be still be generated, and that's fine by me because the counter attacks are supposed to, except for the counter attacks which spend momentum, such as the foresight slash, which makes you completely immune to damage with a bunch of iframes, and then. Something Increase. like foresight slash, I, w I would probably put as a, I would probably put as a maneuver and probably use that as your um, emergency button. <laughs> yeah, spe spend your momentum to do X. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so this this would still generate momentum, which is fine, and limiting limited uh, or making it so it can't use limited abilities, fine. Uh, getting rid of the a portion about flexible attack maneuvers, I agree with. Yeah, and so that's. At that point, that's Longsword. That's everything I have for Longsword. Mm -hmm. And so we move on now to the weapon I have the least for, Sword and Shield. I only have one one talent for Sword and Shield. <laughs> only one, and, and that's Fighter's Power Attack. Because the Sword and Shield has a charged attack now. But other than, other than that, Sword and Shield is as as, um, as vanilla as you can get in Monster Hunter. Most of its most of where it's going to shine isn't in talents, but maneuvers. Um, because it does a lot of uh, like it has a shield bash that does stun damage. It it's very good at hitting precise areas and applying status and elements. Uh, the the thing about the sword and shield in the game, the the big the big draw for it is that for noobs you can use items while you're wielding your weapon because every every other weapon in the game requires you to put the weapon away to sheath it before you can use an item. 
um, in the in the video games. And the it, the other thing about Sword and Shield is it does a lot of quick attacks and stacks uh, elemental damage or status damage very quickly. And then finally, with the Shield Bash, it has some modicum of stun damage, so you can get KOs on on monsters with the Shield Bash of the of the Sword and Shield. But that doesn't really translate to to much when it comes to the talents for this game. The charged the charged portion is the most of it. Um, everything else is going to be maneuvers. You're going to have you know brace for it and defensive fighting. Um, that, that said, one, given the fact that this is our first entry that uses a shield proper, what's the shield AC modifier? So this is this is the second uh, the second weakest blocking tool in the game. Um, so the shield modifier itself is going to be the base shield modifier of plus one. Uh, the only thing that blocks worse than it is the great sword, and the great sword doesn't have a shield modifier. It's just you get the ability to brace for it and, and take a little less damage. Um, so it's it's going to have the, the plus one for the armor class, which means wearing heavy armor, it's going to be the 16 mm -hmm. uh, plus uh, plus others. Yeah. Um, I just wrote in shield bonus. Increase your AC by one. Yeah. And it... Uh, its whole thing is it's is it, it, again with the man, it's going to be the maneuver master. You can think of the sword and shield as almost as near to the actual fighter template as possible. Um, almost, and that's going to be that's going to be the, the, the way it, it deals with things. It's, it, I think that if we were going to give it something special, it has access to all fighter maneuvers. Instead of having some that just wouldn't apply because of, you know, everything else. Mm -hmm. The only other thing that's not going to apply to it is second shot. That maneuver is only for ranged weapons. Yeah. And so, like, that's... But every, every other maneuver here... Uh, is going to be useful. Um, two weapon pressure can even apply technically because uh, the sword and shield in in Monster Hunter is very much two weapons, not just a weapon and a shield. Your shield is an active weapon in in your combos. You hit with it as much as you do your sword. Yeah. Some something else that I sh something else that I should note that I'm put that I that I'm gonna be putting in, and I'm I'm skipping I'm. Sk I'm not covering it. He I'm not covering it here because, uh, because I don't because it's not going to apply. But I uh, but, you know how there's the melee and ranged attack entry for each class. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to when it comes to um, when it comes to the styles that we ha that we have here that I'm put I'm putting a I'm putting that entry there. So mm -hmm. for something like this, it would you would have you would have um you would have say D8 slashing and then D and D8 bludgeoning. Yeah, to make to make clear that what that you are that you're effectively using two weapons. Thirteenth um, Age is very loose regarding two weapon fighting. So if you define the shield in your offhand as also being a bashing weapon that you're using at the same time, yeah, <clears throat> you're both using a shield and two weapon fighting. Um, it's for the same reason that instead of putting a bunch of special rules for um, weapons with reach, they just put the reach tricks feet. And the reach the reach tricks feet is going to be a super useful universal feat for uh, the lances, switch axe, anything that has an axe mode. It, mm -hmm. You get insane amounts of range with them. <laughs> yeah. So, since it sounds like um, power attack is the only talent that sword and shield is going to have, we can move on to dual blades. Now we already you already mentioned moment you already mentioned momentum and swashbuckler. Yes. Um, dual blades is going to be uh, interesting in that its first talent outside of momentum and swashbuckling is going to be in barbarian, and it's going to be violence. And the reason for violence 
is what tier is the, what tier is violence? Isn't that um, champion? champion tier? Yeah, it's champion tier. Um, now again, this is going to be. I'm, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to modify the once per battle to to something else because it is. It, this is essentially going to be tied to the fact that the dual blades does a, does this thing called the demon dance, where it just does a bunch of slashes at once. Mm -hmm. So this was my this was my answer to the demon dance, other than you know tying that also into momentum and swashbuckling. But then you know we also have maneuvers that we can use with momentum that could help with this. Uh, but the the violence. The, the violence here is, in my opinion, going to be um, maybe once per round rather once than once per battle. Um, because of the because of how because of how small the bonus is technically. Yes, and also because of the fact that um, dual blades is a fast attacking weapon. Yeah. Now. There's two. There's two angles when it comes to the champion and, ep and epic feats, and I think one one of them isn't one angle isn't going to be in the book. But for the two champion feats that I have in my unified list, one of them is if the attack still misses, deal half damage. The other is if the attack still misses, you can rage for free as a free action. Um, and I'm rage actually, isn't going to matter, is it? I'm actually curious if you want, if you had considered putting putting rage as a feature for dual blades. No. Um, while demon mode definitely sounds like a raging um, sort of feature, it's it's really not. Um, if you if you read how barbarian rage, the barbarian rage works, um, you use two d twenty for to hit, um, and use the higher roll. So basically, advantage from from five e. Advantage, uh, but if both hit, it's a crit. Mm hmm. Um, it, it it isn't the same as demon mode, uh, which is just uh, increased. It, demon mode is just an increased uh, increased uh, speed and attack um, count when it comes to how it works in the game. The only You're way I could the only way I could see I could see rage um, working is what is once it's activated you. Uh, you always go first, but that is pushing things a bit. And that's why I, that's again why I decided momentum and uh, momentum maneuvers and, and swashbuckle were all going to be a much better fit for how dual blades works. Especially the other, the other problem with using something like rage is it's, is the limited amount of uses where with, I think, I think somebody, I think a DS user or rather, a, rather a deep DB user. Sorry, is go is going to be is going to be shifting out of, in and out of demon mode. They're not going to be using it continuously or using it in one large burst. Yeah, because it, it consumes your stamina as you're using it. Mm -hmm. And so the the champion feed I would go with is the one that's listed in core as deal half damage yeah. even if the attack still misses. Um, now for the epic feats, there's two options we can go with either. You increase the bonus to one d six, or you increase the bonus to one d eight against enemies that have hit you during this during this battle. Uh, the second feat would make more sense. Dual dual blades. Uh, dual blades doing more damage against something you've hit is is more a uh, player reaction than a than a weapon reaction, because then the players get really angry and start doing dumb stuff with demon mode sometimes. <laughs> But it does result in overall higher DPS. Not to mention there are some dual blades builds that uh that use the um the skill heroics a lot, which is when you're low on health you deal a lot more damage. Um But I, I think the the bonus increasing to one D eight if you've been dealt damage makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um simply because they're gonna be doing that one D four per round now rather than per battle so if they've been hit by that target during the battle 
Um, you know, once per round, now they're getting an additional 1d8 bonus to their their damage because now they're hurt and now they don't like you. I should I should note that one one rule that I tend to I tend to have when it comes to action economy is. You, you can either do a full round action or two half rounders, and a standard attack counts as a half round. So you can attack twice in one, in one, tur in one turn, but you can't mm -hmm. move. Which is demon mode all over. When you go into demon mode and do demon dance, which is what I based violence off of, you're stationary. You can't move. Oh, all right. Um, so from there... Uh, the next one I had, let me see here, where do I have you, dual blades? From Ranger, double melee attack. For obvious reasons. <laughs> it's dual blades. <laughs> it's dual blades, why wouldn't it have double melee attack? <laughs> of course the um and give, given what given what I said that makes double melee attack even more ridiculous <laughs> considering what dual blade sometimes does in in uh in monster hunter you'll forgive me if I say this is ridiculousness that's justified yeah um I I need to I need to scroll up so I can see what we had the weapon dive. Okay, so D, so um, normal. It's a, it's two it's two one handed weapons, so it's mm -hmm. two one d eights. All right. I just wanted to make sure I didn't have to I didn't have to do, didn't have to do some surprise edit because your you drop you um drop your weapon die from d eight to d six. Mm hmm. Which makes sense, considering Dual Blades does a lot of tiny hits of damage that stack status and stack a, stack elemental damage really quickly. And because of the fact that it's that um, and I I would actually I'll probably end up putting in a thing that um you can spend momentum to for to force double melee attack to activate. Mm-hmm. Now. When it comes to advent when it comes to the feats, there's two routes we can take with each. The for for adventure, it's your second attack gains a plus two attack bonus if it's against the same target or a different target. I'm thinking same target same, in this case. Same target. Mm -hmm. um, for champion, it's once for battle you can use double melee attack on after an odd attack roll, or if you hit the tar if you hit the target with the first and the second attacks, it takes ten ongoing damage, basically bleed. The bleed makes more sense in this case. Mm -hmm. And the epic is either each turn you can pop free of one enemy before one at before one attack roll that is part of a double melee attack. You can also use your move action in between the two attacks if you wish. And or, what's the other? Or same same as um, champion, but tw but twenty five ongoing damage instead. I think the the ten ongoing damage is going to be more than enough, um, especially since dual blades are going to be doing it constantly. Um, so, popping free of an enemy it means that you disengage automatically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, that actually makes sense. Dual blades has some some attacks in its normal attack range, and not using something like demon mode and du and demon dance. Um, that slingshot it between enemies, so that actually fits uh, thematically. All right, and I I am so glad I used a more theater of the mind style style entry for this more and more. Yep. Yeah, um, I guess I can count that as a case of my intu of having way too sharp of an intuition. <laughs> I would certainly say so. So uh, that's actually the end of what I have for dual blades. We've got the momentum, the, manu the momentum maneuvers, and swashbuckle. We've got the violence, and uh, we've got uh, the uh, double melee attack, and that—that uh, that is everything on my list. Yeah. Um. So next is hammer. 
Hammer is another very simple weapon, like great sword. Think to the great sword's choppy choppy. Hammer is the is is uh is the smashy smashy version. The great sword goes for tails. The hammer goes for heads. And the reason for this, one does choppy choppy damage and chops off tails. The other does smashy smashy damage and knocks monsters out. So you've got a lot of the same stuff on hammer that you would have on great sword. In fact, the exact same stuff. <laughs> so, um, it's, so it's going to have power attack and whirlwind. Power attack and whirlwind, and then uh, beyond that, it's it's going to be more maneuver flavor because hammer does bludgeoning damage first of all, mm -hmm. and I don't know if there's if if there's a talent or a maneuver here that would give, specifically give some sort of knockout or stun damage. Um, um, if so, that we, would, we that would, would qualify as a that would qualify as a bylaw in, in combat. You, okay. Even though it's not, uh, even though it doesn't refer to itself as as such in Thirteenth Age rule, I just write it as strike to stun. Yeah, and that and that's that's what hammer does. That is hammer's whole thing. Great sword and hammer are the two most most simplistic weapons in their in their intention. They are very straightforward. Hit for big numbers, and you're doing one of two types of hitting: cutty cutty, smashy smashy. All right. <laughs> Hammer was a very short entry, and I'm very sorry for that, but that's just how things go sometimes. Okay, next for one that I'm pre that is that I know is going to be a little more complicated. Um, hunting horn. Hunting horn. Well, first of all, like like I said, half of the weapons on this list have whirlwind, and hunting horn swings around like a giant hammer itself. Um, but so in the game. Hunting Horn does more than just swing around and do smashy smashy. Hunting Horn is every bard's best friend. Hunting Horn does songs. And these songs are buffs and and uh and these songs are beneficial. Um as such the other Hunting Horn talents or features because I'm pretty sure one of these is a feature, uh, come from the bard tree. And people may be thinking, but bards are performances and singing. Well, yes, bards are performances and singing. But bards, when I look... And the very first thing that hit my mind like a fucking bolt of lightning was, this is hunting horn. What the fuck? And that is the class feature, Battle Cries. Battle Cries, the description is pretty simple. Bards use Battle Cries to encourage, inspire, warn, and magically aid their allies. Battle Cries are triggered by flexible melee attacks. The Bard makes a melee attack and is able to use a Battle Cry that corresponds to the attack's natural result, sometimes whether or not the attack hits. And then... There's only one rule I'm cutting out, and that's the very end. As a rule, the bonuses provided by Battle Cries can help a Bard's allies, but not the Bard. Hunting Horn specifically buffs the full party, including the Hunter using it. So uh, that line, I'm cutting it right out. What about the Adventurer feat? Uh, you can generate the effect of any first or third level Battle Cry you know as a standard action instead of making a flexible melee attack to see which Battle Cry you're able to trigger. Um... That feat makes sense because hunting horns in the game have specific song lists and specific notes, and the notes are assigned to each type of swing you can make. Having a little bit of more randomness, since this is a tabletop and we aren't going to assign a song list to every type of hunting horn that a that a uh, that someone can wield, <laughs> is is because we're not going into that level of minutia. Um, it, 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 Trading that out for a little bit of randomness with your flexible melee attacks, and then the ability to just generate an effect as a standard action on first or third level battle cries, absolutely fine. That feat makes perfect sense from a tabletop standpoint when trying to adapt the hunting horn. All right. And then 
The talent that applies, I'm sure you already know where I'm going, is Battle Scald. Because you increase the number of battle cries you know by one. Uh, the bonus battle cry can be from your highest possible level. Um, the adventure feat here are there more than are there more than one adventure feat path for this uh, for battle scald? Let me let me put that in. So battle. First off, I can take off the whole. You cannot take this if you've taken the spell singer talent. We're not dealing with spells, so that's not a factor. Yep. Increase the number of battle. Cr Increase the number of battle cries you know. Um, I might I might have to I might have to um mod I might have to modify that um so that so that it fits within the maneuver system. Mm -hmm. I you get I'll probably write it as you actually I know what I know what I'm gonna write this as. You gain one extra maneuver with the battle cry subtype. That works. That definitely works. Can and it can can be from your highest possible level. Now, as far as the feats, I we only have one chain. So the first one is one battle per day. You can use battle cries to help yourself. Um, Doesn't apply. No, then then uh, the, the both the adventurer feat and champion feat mean nothing. Since we are removing the ability, or removing the the restriction that battle cries do not work on the self. Yeah. <clears throat> um. And the the only one that the only one that would apply then is the epic feat. Reroll an attack that was meant to trigger a battle that was meant to trigger a battle cry, but didn't. Yeah. Um. And since since the other two feats do have to go away, um. What I would actually suggest as a um, as a feat chain would just be increasing levels of that. Once per battle for the adventurer level, once per round for the champion level, and then once per turn at the epic level. Because mechanically in the actual video game, every swing of your weapon, whether it hits or misses the monster, generates a note. And then you can and then you can perform to actually pull out that that song. Um, so you're always guaranteed at the end of a chain of attacks to have a song ready. So whether those attacks hit or miss. Adventurer is once per battle. Um, champion was once per what? Round. And then the epic was once per turn. Because there may be, there may be uh, times where, like you said, you have two, uh, e two half actions. Each one, each uh, attack only takes half of that action. Mm -hmm. But if you use both, you can't uh, can't move. Um, if you swing twice and only one of those triggers a battle cry, you can then reroll the other for that battle cry. And the next time your turn comes around, you could do the same, depending on if you go that way. Yeah, if I wanted to get pedantic about how I'd write it, I'd just write it at move, um, a move, a, a move action gets integrated into a standard action. Okay. Um, so, Battle Cries, Battle Scald, and Whirlwind. Yep. And, uh, <clears throat> and then from there, that's basically everything. Uh, Hunting Horn's whole thing is it centers around those, those Battle Cries. Which is why I, I wanted to add in as much as I could regarding how often those battle cries are going to uh, are going to occur. Yep. Um, um, so for for maneuvers, what do you what have you got? No, sorry, not for maneuvers. For uh, next, we have Lance. Ah, uh, Lance. Lance was an interesting one. It got some skills that nobody else did. Um, and the first one it got is from Barbarian. In fact. Um, and this is an epic tier talent from Barbarian. Relentless. Because Lance's, um, uh, uh, well, actually, we should first go back to the chart, mm -hmm. the, uh, the actual chart for the class. Lance would be the only shield 
that adds a plus three to AC. Because it's the most guardy of all of the guarding weapons in the game. And that's also why I chose Relentless. Uh, lances, specifically, in the game, Lances is, is, is a fairly... It seems fairly straightforward. It's really not. Lance is actually really hard to play. Lances are a little less maneuverable because when you have the weapon out, um, you you do short hops as your disengages rather than full-on rolls, but it's still a disengage. Mm -hmm. um, you can block. You can charge. Like, you can legitimately charge. And so that's a, that's a maneuver it would have, the, a charging from one enemy to another. I forget the name of the maneuver right now. Um but the the big thing about lances it is very very guardy and it is very very stabby and so relentless in, is where the lances super guard is there is a stance you can take super armor it, it well no it's it's much more than that um lances super guard in the game Plants you stationary, for one. Puts an puts a, a guard up aura over your shield for two. And negates damage behind you uh, in most cases for three. Additionally, uh, it starts spending stamina, and it, you take much, much reduced damage. With a proper build using the super guard on a lance and the guard up skill. You can tank any of the of the supernovas of the elder dragons. You can tank through them and still retain usually about half health. So this this is why I said relentless was perfect for Lance. This is your super guard. This is you planting shield up. Everything behind you is gonna be fine, and everything in front of you is gonna do way less damage. I feel like this. I feel like what a. What immediately comes to mind is the good old Pike Square tactics that were solely designed to fuck up horses. <laughs> um, something like that. It, it's also the whole, you see a giant wave of fire coming at you, someone comes up with a giant shield and the wave of fire splits around it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's what this super guard is. I should I should note that when I've written the shield bonus for the for the ones that apply, um, I wrote it as you increase your base AC by three, and yes. I chose that wording for a very specific reason. So th so that uh, so in case somebody in case somebody wants to fuck around with touch attacks and um, flat footed, Because if it was now, if it was just a situ if it was just a pl if it was just a situational modifier, then they'd they'd lose that bonus if they were flat footed, which wouldn't make sense. Now, with relentless, obviously we have to remove the wild raging uh, mm -hmm. requirement. As for the epic feat, is that the only one that's it, it, the one I see in core? Is that the only one in the in the entire feat chain? Hang on, let me. See. So instead, you have you have resist damage twelve plus, and. As, I should note that I, li I like the I like the um, approach to damage resistance in Thirteenth Age versus others, where it's a case of a static penalty. No, it's a case of if your if your opponent doesn't roll a natural twelve or higher in this case, they don't even hit you, <laughs> or they or they hit you, but they don't they don't do damage. Mm -hmm. Um, I have I have two. There's two that there's. There's two that I have. One is even when not raging, whenever you score a critical hit, you gain resist damage 12 plus until the start of your next turn, or you increase the resistance to 14 plus. Increasing the resistance to 14 plus as the epic feat is the one that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The other one um, might make sense in some contexts, like while you're poking. Uh, uh, there are certain. There's a skill. There's a. There's a mechanic. In sh in the some of the larger shielded weapons called guard points, where during certain movements your shield is out anyway, and that actually counts as a better guard than just normally guarding because it's technically counted as a counter attack. Mm -hmm. um, should Lance have an extra five foot reach? <sighs> um, no. Should... Lances are 
about as long as um, at the longest point are about as long as a long sword. So, like long swords. When I say long swords are longer than great swords, I mean they are longer than great swords. The entire reason you wear the long sword diagonally across your back is because if you wore it straight up and down, you couldn't walk. It's taller than you. Yeah, I um. I I will not deny that I've made some Sephiroth jokes about the long sword. You're not the only one. I am. Sh I would be disappointed if I was. So now let's get to his now let's get to his powder based brother, the Gun Lance. Actually, we're not done with Lance yet. Oh. Uh, I have here because. Remember how I said there are guard points and they count as counter attacks? Yes. <laughs> I see where this is going. Yeah, the next thing Lance has is counter attack. Um, Lance also has two other things in the fighter tree that we'll get to. <laughs> um. So We've already covered counterattack, but yes, Lance actually has a skill where you block with the shield, and then after the shield blocks, you sweep with the lance. And that, uh... Not sure if that should qualify under Whirlwind. It's not all the way around, it's just in front of the lance, so that's why I didn't qualify it as Whirlwind. Mm -hmm. Um... After, after, after counterattack, um, heavy warrior. Let's see, heavy warrior. Once per battle, while we while wearing heavy armor, when you are hit by an attack that targets AC as a free action, you can take half that da damage from that attack instead. Because of his giant shield. I'll prob I'll probably I'm gonna put Heavy Warrior in, but I'll probably retitle that Heavy Shield. Yeah. And uh, the epic feat, uh is there an alternative for the epic feat there? Um No. Okay, so uh, Um I don't know. I don't know how 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 you'll how you'll finagle with that feat. I'm I'm gonna get rid I'm gonna get rid of it for now. Okay. Not ev not every not every feature, st not every feature um require requires a full ace. Yeah. And then the final uh, talent that Lance gets, <laughs> skilled intercept. I was wondering how long it would take before this would show up. Skilled intercept is a uh, skilled intercept is going to show up a few times. I'm, I'm going to add. Mm -hmm. See, norm, more, norm, more than just lands. <laughs> who's moving to attack one of your nearby allies? You can pop free from one enemy and move to intercept the attack. I I consider this the dash because the charge actually has your shield in front of you and, um, in some cases, can even deflect small attacks. So this is this is Lance going into his charge stance, charging forward and getting in front of his ally, essentially. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Adventurer feet can pop free from two en from two enemies. Uh, is that the only one that, that's on the unified list? Let's see. Then I don't have I don't have any alternate chains, so yeah, we're looking at the same feet chain for skilled intercept. Okay, um, popping free from up to two enemies makes uh, makes sense if you're dealing with packs of the small monsters, or if you're if you've been surrounded by more than one big monster. Mm -hmm. um, bonus to your skilled intercept save equal to the escalation die makes perfect sense. As things are getting worse, you're going to be like, "Oh shit!" more often. Yeah. And then enemies can't make AOO against you during skilled intercept movement. That makes perfect sense. I should note that the ex escalation die is a case of accidental genius. I love it. Since the escalation die makes me very happy. 
since in co- in context it's supposed to represent fights getting more desperate with time. In practice, it is a very effective cap from people going Nova. <laughs> yep. So um, and that that is the end of the Lance's talents. All right. Now we now we get to his powder based brother. The gun lance. So right, for, first first things first, does he have a shield bonus? Yes, his shield bonus is plus two to base AC. Because his shield isn't as good as Lance's, but it's still really good. Um The Gun Lance, as Monk so aptly puts it, is the the shield's gunpowder based brother. Um gun lances are interesting. They do the pokey pokey real well. They do the shieldy shieldy real well. Not either as well as Lance. But that's because they also have the bang bang <laughs> of uh, of having shelling. They have explosive damage. And introduced in World, they also have the worm stake. Where they stab a, what's essentially a giant fuse lit bomb of a stake into the monster. <laughs> Now, <laughs> because they don't have the super armor, I'm standing still, nothing is getting past me stance, they don't get relentless. They also don't have a counter attack. But they do have a power attack. <laughs> because you can charge up shelling. You can charge up a shell and make it a bigger boom. <laughs> they also have skilled intercepts, but not because they can run. This is the one case where I'm rule of cooling in one skill that has been seen in two games, and that's the blast dash. <laughs> I where think they I can figure it out just by that name alone. Oh, it's up on Capcom's website. Anybody who wants to see what the hell the Blast Dash is, just go look at the Gunlance entry. Um, but yeah, the Blast Dash is essentially using your power attack to fly! <laughs> and so that's where they can get in front of their friends. I would laugh, but as, but I have, I have played my fair share of Boomer Shooters, and thus I am very inundated with rocket jumping. Oh, this is way more than rocket jumping. It's a jet. It's a literal jet. Um, but yeah, uh, Gun Lance is basically Lance, but explosive damage is mixed in somewhere, and also it can semi jet itself around the battlefield. Um, when it comes to when it comes to weapon when it comes to damage sites, I'm guessing we're do, I'm guessing we're doing piercing and or explosive. Yes, piercing and or explosive. Mm-hmm. Um, the worm stake would be an equipment slash maneuver thing we would discuss. Uh, shelling would have a certain amount of uses in a like like you could shell uh, so many times around and then you'd have to re re uh, or so many times a battle and then you'd have to go spend a uh, a standard action to reload or whatever. Things of that nature are again the minutia we're not we're not diving into. Yeah, that sort of minutia I would I would go under I would go under the um go under the whole unified unified charges for certain um weapon specific equipments that I'm using. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because and then because even because um obvious because with a lot of with a lot of the with a lot of the um char- charges or even or even ranged weapon um archetypes mm-hmm. there's sta- there's of course standard ammo and there's custom ammo and custom ammo is a uh, all the abound in the, in the ranged weapons we'll get to that mm-hmm. oh, man but... I miss coatings for sword and shield though coatings were nice generations should bring back coatings well we I'll probably when I when I when I write more on this on my own I'd probably put I probably put in coatings that would count that would count under this um and so uh, I'd probably have to ask you what what a good ra- what a good range for sh- for shelling would be at a later date. 
Oh, shelling's close range. It's the same range as your as no, your. I, uh, as your I mean, is I mean in terms of how how many? Yeah, uh, what would be a good what would be a good baseline as far as how many, char how many um charges uh, before you'd have to okay. reload? Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, because you couldn't just go with the normal set of charges found in the game because it's, the game's a lot faster than a turn based RPG. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. Well, Gunlance was simple. But also a lot of fun because you can literally jetpack around the, the battlefield. Yeah. <laughs> so so far with talents we have power attack and skilled intercept. Uh, yep. And that is all the gun lance gets uh, uniquely. Everything else would be down to maneuvers mm -hmm. and the and the charges. All right. Now for your boy, um, the switch axe. Yes, the, the swax, swax, as you insist on calling it. It is the Swax, because it's my swag. Come on, now. The Switch Axe, or Slash Axe, however you'd like to call it, depending on your region. Um, first, I'm going to gush a little about the weapon, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to play into what was chosen and why. Uh, this is a weapon that is very versatile. It starts as an axe, changes to a giant sword, depending on uh, what you do with your morphing properties, making it a very versatile weapon around the field. Um the sword mode also makes it so that it ignores bouncing. It has natural mind's eye in the in the game. So in this case, this would be basically like ignoring any bonus to AC of swords. You you deal more AC damage. Um, as such, though, it also has a lot of fun things you can do, like charging up its file to make it blow up on the monster and then it has to recharge for a little bit for many of these reasons especially the fact that it has a charge mechanic and it has things that are uh well things that just can't be described with a normal maneuver it also gets momentum and swashbuckle mm -hmm. those are included with the switch axe because it has the sword gauge and it has uh element discharge abilities now as i said i'm not going to make this like the switch axe in that in that respect you can switch between sword and axe in your mind however you'd like to because again theater of the mind um and what the momentum actually does is make it so that you can use some of the more advanced attacks and also swashbuckle allows you to use my favorite move in the world the Zero sum element discharge. But again, I'll get to that in a second. Because that's going to be my piece de resistance. Now, Switch Axe, when it has... When it, when I've, I've decided when it has momentum, it's in the amped state. When it has a high enough momentum threshold, or when it has momentum, uh, it's in the amped state. And in the amped state, the first, the first thing that happens is it gets an extra talent. But this is a conditional talent. Um... And that's violence. Because in the video games, when the switch axe is in an amped state, all hits do a second hit. It's a, it, You hit them, and it leaves behind some residual um, file energy, and then the file energy explodes a little bit afterwards. Uh, so this, this would be from the Barbarian Tree again, and... This is essentially only performed when they have momentum. It can only be performed while they have momentum. On top of that, uh, that's actually really all Switch Axe gets. It's going to be a maneuver-heavy weapon, um, especially with some of the additional things it can do, like Cleave. Oh, no, wait, that's right. It does get cleave, because... Oh, man, does it get cleave. I should I, I should have made a note looking at cleave. All, all melee weapons get cleave. Yes, even the blunt ones! Shush! And I am, I am editing that in right, right now, going right from the top, so... so all, all, all melee weapons get cleave, even the blunt ones. Are you, having, you. Are you having it as once per battle still? Um, yeah, because most of the time you're not going to be fighting big groups of enemies as a, mo as a monster hunter. You're going to be fighting one big monster. 
fighting the packs of small small monsters is only really going to be one battle. So yes, once per battle makes sense. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'll put that in. Now, dual blades is getting cleave as well. No, nah, with dual blade we can we can we can give we can make sure that it still has. Because uh... you said you said every melee you said every melee is getting cleave. No, yeah, no, dual blades and sword and shield get cleave too. Fuck it. <laughs> Fuck it. They both get it. All right, I just Cause... I just added it to hammer. Um, adding it to hunting horn. <laughs> Everybody gets it. <laughs> Every single one of them. That's melee. Um, because you can't really cleave. <laughs> Lance gets it. Is gun? Is gun Lance getting it? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, wide shelling can kill three small animals at once. What are you talking about? And I'm put. I'm putting it. I'm putting it in in individual weapons in individually. Yeah. Um, because if I put it under the universal talents, then everybody would get. Then everybody would get it. It's only the melee weapons. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it wouldn't really make sense for light bow gun, heavy bow gun, and bow to have it. Yep. Now. To describe the zero sum element discharge and why swashbuckle is needed to do it. <laughs> zero sum element discharge in the game is your your axe is now in an amp state and you switch to sword mode and you go to do a normal element discharge. In it, normally when the hunter goes to do a normal element discharge, he just stabs the sword out, starts charging the file energy and lets it all explode at once. Zero sum element discharge the monster hunter grapples the enemy, stabs the sword into the monster, charges the element inside the monster, and explodes the element inside the monster. There is a reason Swashbuckle is needed. I would also consider this a power attack, but I mean, that it's Swashbuckle, so I mean, Swashbuckle covers basically all of that. Yeah. But that is Switch Axe. <clears throat> now we go... Oh, that's right. Uh, Switch Axe also gets Whirlwind. I forgot about that. Let me, put... Let me grab that. I forgot to look up at Whirlwind because I was like, eh. I'm talking about Switch Axe. Let me gush. <laughs> now, when it comes to... When it comes to Switch Axe... Um... Are you ha are you having a diff are you having different damage calculation for the s for the axe and sword mode or not? No. If anything, there'd be another uh, in in encounter bylaw for sword mode, um, doing higher AC damage, and that's really it. Or doing more AC damage, or something along those lines. Um. Given the idea of the, I, I think, I think ignore, I think ignoring, I think ignoring AC is a little bit too powerful. That's why I didn't say ignoring AC, just doing a little more AC damage. Um, problem is there isn't really the, there isn't really a concept of AC damage in this in these kind of games. Um. Some of the feats were mentioning if things were ta were targeting your AC. Um, keep in mind that P PD and MD is physical and mental defense, basically yeah. a streamlined version of the um, of the def of the defenses at, of the saving throws as defenses that was in 4E. Yeah. Um, the I'd say the I'd say the best approach is that there is that is there is. In one of the modes, their AC is X um, amount lower than it than normal. Yeah, um, 
and we can and we can discuss a maneuver to change from axe mode to sword mode. That would be a that would be a half action. That wouldn't be a full round standard action. Um, the only that, th uh, that's some that's something that is going to qualify under minutia. It's going to be beyond the scope of the, of this of this discussion. Yeah. The re the reason I the reason I'd br I I'd want to bring it up is I I'd want to make sure that there's that but that when it comes to the mode switching weapons there is some kind of trade off. Yes. Yes. Um. I would okay. So the trade off would be axe is able to use um reach tricks, sword is not. The axe is longer than the sword in all in all situations with a with um with switch axe. So you have reach tricks, but not um, lower the AC, the target counts as a, having a slightly lower AC in axe mode, and then you have no reach tricks, but the target acts as if it has a slightly lower AC in sword mode. Mm -hmm. That's your trade-off. Reach tricks versus reduced uh, reduced target AC. All right. Any other t any other talents for for switch axe, or is that it? That's all she wrote. So now we go on to another sword and shield, the charge blade. The charge blade is interesting. People are like, but that's just a sword and shield, except you're wearing the shield on the wrong arm now. Um, no, I'm joking. <laughs> you're wearing the shield on, on, the, on a different arm. The way the charge blade works is you attack in, in the sword and shield mode to build up your files. And then in, and then once your files are built up, you morph to X mode to attack with the file energy. Uh, the charge blade is actually an axe, mostly. That's why it's called the charge axe in, in Japan. And it all works by combining the sword into the shield and then it morphing out into an axe, and it's actually really cool. Uh... I've simplified things a bit. There still is the mode switch, but the mode switch is directly related to uh, directly related to how you're fighting, and then there are extra maneuvers for the axe mode while it while you have momentum, because that's your files. Mm -hmm. There's one extra talent that occurs outside of axe mode, um, and we'll get to that. So. Uh, first, Charge Blade also has Whirlwind. Because oh. in Axe Mode, it swings around like a lot. And even the sword has a giant round slash. Alright. <sighs> we already put in Momentum and Swashbuckle. Yep, because that's a, that's our... Those are our charge mechanics. I, I, I think that that was a masterstroke of genius when I saw that. Because... Momentum and Swashbuckle are freeform enough that you can use them for our for our file and charge mechanics with these weapons. On top of that, when you have momentum, Charge Blade has counterattack. In sword and shield mode, the shield um, acts as a guard point, and I can't. I can't really get the, the actual mechanic across, because usually the guard points are only while morphing from axe to sword or sword to axe. But I decided just in shield mode, you have counterattack while you have momentum. Um, because the shield lets off energy when an, when an enemy hits it during a guard point, and it's charged. So, when you have momentum, you have the counterattack talent in, sh in sword and shield mode. Um, whereas in axe mode, you have all of the extra moment, uh, a lot of the extra momentum maneuvers, and you have the swashbuckle to do the amped element, uh, its own version of the amped element discharge. Would you have it that that while you have momentum, that's when you that's when you're using the um, the sword mode? No, because sword mode is what's required to charge momentum. Um, you can't Sorry, gain not, file. Not sword axe. Um, I would say that that's when you would get the ability to morph. Yes, it, once you have momentum, you can morph into axe mode and use the axe as much as you want. I'm probably going to list that as a free action. Yes, definitely. 
uh, because otherwise it's too heavy of a trade off. Um, yeah. And but but you can you can switch between the two while you have momentum at any time because you can still use the sword mode for the counter attack. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, uh, charge blade is our third weapon to have guild intercept because uh, of the fact that charge blade, while it doesn't have something to immediately like jet over like gunlance does or to run over like lance does it's a fast weapon already and it's got a big shield which reminds me its shield bonus is also plus two because gun lance and charge blade have the same shield uh shield bonus uh in game at least as far as i'm aware All right. that may have changed and i may not be aware of that um are you gonna have it that it's that that the um sh that the shield bonus is mode specific or not? Yes, it is mode specific. If you don't have a shield, uh, if you're in axe mode, you don't have a shield anymore. That's the axe head. Your your shield is the axe head. <laughs> so again, your your trade off is more damage and more maneuverability for less defensibility. That's you lose your counter attack. You lose your shield bonus when you go to axe mode. And that's uh, everything that the Charge Blade has. Mm -hmm. Charge Blade uh, is a fun weapon, too. I actually like playing it from time to time. Finally, we get to what has strangely become somewhat of a red-headed stepchild amongst the melee weapons. Uh, the Insect Glaive. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I've never seen an in-between. So, a little bit about the Insect Glaive, it is an aerial weapon for the most part. It does jumping and vaulting and fun shenanigans like that. And initially this was because the game it was introduced in, 4, uh, ha had introduced the mounting mechanic, and you got mount damage by hitting with aerial attacks. So, the mount master was the Insect Glaive. Um, however, it's, it's kind of lost that niche. There's a lot of aerial options, especially in Rise now, with uh, with the wire bugs, and even when there wasn't, there was a lot of vert vertical movement with World because of the way the the world was now being rebuilt and reshaped since the zones were no longer that specific. So mm -hmm. the Insect Glaive has kind of lost its initial purpose and become more of a burst DPS of sorts. And with that, Insect Glaive is the last weapon we have that gets Whirlwind. It's All a right. long staff with a big blade on the end, and you swing it around yourself a lot. Mm -hmm. On top of that, uh, Insect Glaive doesn't get much else other than Momentum and Swashbuckle and one specific Ranger skill that I'll get into. Ranger's Pet. Insect glaives all come with what is known as a kinsect. Kinsects are giant fighting bugs that are used as part of the weapon set. They're semi-autonomous. You can send them out and you can call them back. And they basically uh, mount your arm. And they're the size of your forearm. These are giant bugs. And... Uh, I'm not making momentum specific on them like it would be if we were in the game because mm -hmm. that would be f fucking terrible for an uh, for a tabletop. But I am making them a sort of additional um, source of utility and friendship and trying to get that last bit of the insect glaive into its identity. Ranger's pet gives you that kinsect. It's on your arm unless you send it out. When you send it out, it can attack the enemy and uh, do depending on the, let's say depending on the bug, it can do different things. Um, and well, that's minutia. That's this bug maybe poisons, has the ability to poison things and can on a specific type of attack poison the enemy, etc. Those are things that can be discussed in the minutia. But this gives the insect glaive 
uh, the 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 insect part of that. Momentum and swashbuckle give the insect glaive the uh, the additional maneuvers and the ability to vault into the air because it's got a what's essentially a pneumatic pole vault built built in. And that is uh, that's really all insect glaive uh, needed in this case was mm -hmm. was those four particular talents. Yep. So we have cleave, momentum, ranger's pet, swashbuckle, and whirlwind. Yes. So that I count five, but that but yeah. I said four because every every melee weapon gets cleave. Mm -hmm. And with that, we've covered all of the melee weapons. We've covered. Uh, we've actually covered what in previous games would be considered the babby weapons to some stupid elitists and grogs. Because back in the day, when we did have the differences between gunner armor and blade master armor, uh, the grogs thought that you were a good... Uh, player when you could finally start fighting with the bow guns and bow and use gunner armor and not die but we we all know how we feel about elitists like that monk yeah they they can they can kiss my big black ass exactly now i hate to say it but the differences between light bow gun heavy bow gun and bow are mostly equipment loadout related. They're going to be, you know, what types of ammos you have, what types of coatings you have, what types of, um, what types of of uh, of deviation they have in that respect. I don't know that that ma that manifest in this game. At, as such. Most of them only get uh, they, they they get mostly all the same um, talents, which is unfortunate. Um, we've already given them an equivalent to Dead Eye Archer, in a way. You know, longbow and and light bow gun are D eight ranged weapons, but the longbow doesn't go up. I'm perfectly yeah. fine with put with putting in de with. Putting in Dead Eye Archer as, as something that th that can be ga can be gained through regular talent slots, just uh, just um up just upping the step, and then and then the feet chain. Um, I like the feet chain as it is, like the feet chain as I'm seeing in core, works perfectly. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's that's. That's something that applies to all three of them, which is unfortunate. Um, another thing that applies to all three of them is technically all the way down in Ranger, the uh, the actual archery class talent, or you one of your misranged attacks. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think once per once per round would be better than once per battle, but I don't know how that's going to affect uh, the champion feat chain. Um, well, I have I have I do have two routes when it comes to ar when it comes to archery. Okay. All right, the first one for, for adventure for adventure feat is archery gains plus two attack rolls and crit range expands by one. Um. Or once per battle, when you hit with a ranged attack, the enemy is hampered. Save ends. Uh, the second one actually makes more sense because a lot of what the a lot of what the bow guns do and what the bow does is apply statuses and and uh, elemental damage. Mm -hmm. And so a hamper could be seen as as playing into that status application. All right, um, champion. Um, once per day, you can use archery twice in the same battle. Um, or your ranged attacks gain a plus two bonus to hit against dazed, weakened, hampered, stunned, and stuck opponents. Uh, the second one again makes more sense. All right, and... especially 
again, especially considering how equipment based these are these weapons are going to be. Mm -hmm. And third, once per day you can turn a normal hit with a with a ranged attack into a critical, or you regain all once per battle effects of this talent after you rally. Um, uh, rally is thirteenth age's version of second wind. Yeah, I, w I would say uh, it'd be the first one in this case, where you can, once per day, you can turn the normal hit with a ra ranger ranged attack into a critical hit. Because mm -hmm. um, that reminds me of uh, the Wyvern Fire Mines for the Light Bow Gun, or the Cluster Bombs, or Wyvern Fire Cannon for the Heavy Bow Gun, or even the Dragon Piercer for the Bow. Um I would I would say that um there is one thing one of these three weapons gets that none of the others do and it's only been introduced with its newest incarnation heavy bow gun in monster hunter rise can charge up its shots so heavy bow gun gets power attack All right, let me. <laughs> I I actually watched my buddy using a heavy bow gun in Rise when he was streaming it on Discord. <laughs> the ridiculous amounts of damage you do with a heavy bow gun are just so dumb. Oh my god, it is so dumb. Um, I do feel I do feel like when it comes to the bow guns, they um, they are they are re they are very much on the on the end of repeat damage. Basically, basically you're firing until you have to until you have to reload. Whereas bo whereas bows, you're just dr you're just drawing individual arrows or sometimes clusters of arrows. Yeah, and and uh, bows have the ability to charge their shots but i didn't i didn't see any way because the, the way bows charge their shots is different than other weapons that charge their attack even heavy bow guns is more about uh doing the the additional burst to damage like the great sword or the hammer or the anything else like that what when bow charges its shots it, it gets further a, a longer uh a, attack range so that it, you aren't out of effective attack range and a higher crit percentage so it's it's a little different with bow uh, additionally charging allows you know charging does allow just for more damage but you you tend to do multiple hits with each shot after the first the first one tends to shoot one then two then like three something that i'm considering Mm -hmm. When it comes to heavy bowgun, is maybe it's just me, but I've always seen heavy bowgun as the ra as the ranged style that would most like that would most likely benefit, or at least make sense to utilize some form of Overwatch. Um, I guess. Um, but the 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 big thing about the bowguns and the and the bows in the game, even though they're ranged weaponry. They still have to stay pretty close to a monster to do effective damage. Um, Which, it's not that does bring that does bring me to to one thing. Would you would you say that that there thirteenth age doesn't have specific range increments in term in terms of feet, yards, meters, or whatever? Mm -hmm. It it listed off as um, engaged, clo clo um, close, near, and far. I believe. Let me. Um, let me double check to, so I'm not talking out of my ass. Okay. So let me see here. Okay, I was slightly wrong. There are only three. Um, there are only three distances. Engaged, you're in direct melee combat. Nearby, um, one move away, and far away, more than one move away. Um, in that respect. Uh, if if that's how it's staggered, that's actually pretty easy. Obviously, all melee weapons are going to be engaged and engaged only, with with exceptions being, you know, the reach tricks that you can do. But um, I'm, think I'm thinking, 
Bowguns aren't bowguns are nearby and um, bows are far away. Uh, actually, it's the other way around. Light bowgun and bow would be near. Heavy bowgun would be far. Heavy bowguns have the have the furthest effective range. And um, while this is again more equipment set than um, than feats or features or talents or anything, uh, bow has a, co a coating called close range coating, which is essentially with, when you're within melee range of a monster, you do more damage. So while a bow is most comfortable at near, if it were using close range coating, you'd want to be engaged. <laughs> And just point blank shot the bastards. Well, I'm I'm listing this off as as maximum range with without um, penalties. Yeah. So if somebody was to, if you were to use far away while firing a bow, that would be a minus two. You'd either not hit or you'd do negligible damage. Mm-hmm. So, okay, I got that in. It, 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 it's the really unfortunate nature of the ranged weapons that they, they tend to overlap in certain areas. Um, <clears throat> especially, the, the really unfortunate overlap is between light bowgun and bow. They both tend to fill the same niche of applying statuses and elements, whereas heavies can do that, but heavies are much more about doing the damage. They're the big burst damage of the, of the ranged weapons. When it comes to the trinity of, um, when it comes to the whole um, sc um, scatter, pierce, and rapid, I get the feeling those would count under specific maneuvers for the bow. Yeah. Yeah, um, and of course, you know, scatter, pierce, and rapid and normal for the ammo types of the of the bow guns as well. Although, given that, given that, because what I'm looking at it on on the notes, it's it says that to access those shots, the weapon has to be charged. So, should that should that count under um, under the bow having having um, um, momentum? Um. Momentum or a power attack? No, I would say that it would just have you'd have to prepare. If there's some if if there's a declared pre preparation of some sort, you'd have to sacrifice a maybe a half a half a half of your your um how how you have the action economy split into the two half mm -hmm. half actions. You'd have to spend one action taking the time to declare and aim and use that type of shot. Let me let me check something. Okay. Because charging the bow is is different than as I said, it's different than charging the other weapons. Um, somebody did make a sister feat to double melee attack called double ranged attack. Would are there any that you can think of that would any range that would qualify under that? Um. Light bow gun. It tends to ha it tends to shoot pretty quickly. Maybe double ranged attack could apply to light bow gun, or bow if it's using the double shot. But again, that's that's more situational when it comes to bow. Um. Like I'm lo I'm looking. I'm looking at a good chunk of them, and a, a lot of them are a lot of them would qualif would qualify under um, things that I think because with all the talents that we put in, these are talents that are going to be innate. They're going to be innate. That's mm. not put. That's putting aside talents that they're going to be getting through the uh, talent slots at character creation, and that that does mean that they're getting more. T that they're starting out with more talents than a normal thirteenth age character. But this is the way it had to be done, in my opinion. Yes. That's that's absolutely true. I understand that concern. 
Um, but monster hunters, as uh, by and large, monster hunters are stronger than normal people to begin with. And if you were to pit up, if you, if I were to take a level one fighter from Thirteenth Age and put it up against a monster hunter at the beginning of Monster Hunter Rise, uh, as a comparison, that level one fighter is getting stomped, ruffle stomped into the ground. Uh, there's just no way that he'll that he'll compare to that beginning hunter. Mm-hmm. And that's because of the nature of the beasts that the hunters fight. Like I said, it's megafauna. And in some cases, later on in their careers, literal forces of nature manifest as dragons. <laughs> so, monster hunters are already larger than life in that respect. Um... Their weaponry, their ethos and pathos, everything about them reflects that. And as such, the the types of abilities they have are going to be plethora. Mm-hmm. But I th- I think that I think that more or less more or less covers the bunch. And I can safely say that while while it's probably going to take me a while. Um, I will be expanding on this on my own time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm probably go- I'm probably going to once I ha- once I have a decent amount of expansion. I'm probably going to put I'm probably going to put it as a um. I'm probably going to put it as a do- as a um, shared document for the co- for the council. Because mm-hmm. there's a lot more, there's a lot more classes, talents, and the like that I have in my personal archives that I didn't send to you. The reason yeah. I, the reason I kept it to just the core book and thirteen true ways was so not to overwhelm. Exactly, I think too much information would have likely uh, led to me having a little bit more, uh, as you pointed out, choice paranoia. Mm-hmm. I would have looked at it and gone, "This could fit, but so could this." I even had that problem with a little bit, a few things, um, with just the core book. I was like, "Well, murderer applies to some of these things, right?" And then I thought about it. I'm like, "Eh, only peripherally." I, I, and, and then someone asked me when I was talking to some friends about it. Well, what about a rogue sneak attack damage? I'm like, "Do you really do sneak attack damage to monsters?" <laughs> like, I understand, yeah, doing a precision hit. And but that's a maneuver. We have precision strike for that. Mm. Um, and it's not <laughs> critical damage is covered by critical rolls. And it's just uh, there, there were a lot of things for me to consider that I had to continue tweaking and pairing. And eventually, I pared down to what we have here. Yeah. But th- I think that is g- that is going to do it for this particular experiment. This was definitely a fun one. I'll li- I'll likely do- I'll likely be doing this with something that's a li- that's a little bit less um, niche. Although even if even when I say that, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be scaring off a few a few people because because appa- apparently I intimidate people when it comes to game design. <laughs> s- I guess it's much in the same way that apparently Worf is intimidated by Cisco. <laughs> too um, much black for him to handle either either that or i don't know when you've seen when you've seen someone punch a a extra dimensional god are you do you really want to fight that sure i'd love to have a scrap with someone who des- who decides to defy the gods like i do um and although to be, although to be fair q had that coming for years yeah, I'm surprised that you know Riker never did it. To be honest, but, see Riker do it. <laughs> but with but um, we will be we will be back next week. I am uh, I have to apologize in advance for all the technological shenanigans, and just for the sake of it, let me see what's on, what's on the schedule for next week. Something else I'm looking forward to. I already remember that. Okay, let's see. Oh, this next week will be fun. Next week will be fun. And, <laughs> exactly. Um, I can safely say that for for, ne- for next week, 
it would be very easy for me to for me to just for me to just dunk on this company for some of the obvious re for some of the obvious reasons, but no. The reason why the you'll see you'll you'll all see next week, but I have I have had an attitude that just dunking on a company for wokeness or for politics is too easy when there are other problems that can that can that deserve just as much focus. But you'll see that next week. That said, tomorrow we've tomorrow I got something interesting because I will be interviewing um, the head of Discami Gaming, Mark McKinnon. Because he's putting out Anime 5e, which has been absolutely killing it lately, and put and put a put a bit of an announcement that I want to turn into a little event. But that is a story for another day. So until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. <laughs>